PS5 games, finally. And hopefully look at the console. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square, the PlayStation podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, as always, Mr. Saul Bridges, bringing you guys to a lucky new episode. Um, <laughs> 140, is it seven or it's six? Not, it's not or? One, I don't think it's 140 at all. 160. <laughs> 195,000. 160. Uh, Who knows? Stick around to the end of the episode where you guys can find out where to catch us and where to watch us at. And we'll start this episode up right like we normally do. Brett, what have you been playing? Okay, so the first thing I got to talk about is Maneater, uh, which I think by the time that we had last recorded, I either expressed interest in or had started. You had, you had already expressed what had happened to you. By the last time we recorded? I'm pretty sure, yeah. I don't, maybe. Okay, either way. Um, lost my save due to the game crashing. Uh, as you may know, if you follow us either with the episodes, if I didn't mention it, or if nothing else, I've talked about it on uh, social media. Uh, the game crashed during an autosave, which completely ruined my save file and normally that would push me off but i was really enjoying the game so much that i was like i'm gonna try and restart and since i know kind of how to get the game to where i need to be quicker i was able to get back to where i was in about half the time uh so then i followed through played that until i got the platinum and that was an easy game to kind of just be like oh i'll beat the game but let's just keep going and go ahead and get the platinum because it's not that much harder it does that great trophy thing where it's like you don't got to replay the game again uh everything you can do is just after you beat the game and you just keep playing it's kind of like minecraft dungeons trophies list kind of even though we'll get into minecraft dungeons in a second uh because god but uh Uh i I know no no this is for the most part good okay but um Yeah, outside of that bug, I really, uh, there's some people that were saying, and there's actually a list, the developer tweeted back at me and said, we know that this is one of the issues. Here's another list of issues to be looking out for and things you can do to try and prevent or at least lessen the impact on you while we work on getting it fixed, which I appreciate. Yes, in the ideal world, the game would not have come out with these issues, but... I do tend to give a little more leniency to smaller developers that are doing a little bit more interesting games because they tend to come with a lower budget, which means there's a tends to be a little less quality control by nature of the impossibility of working within that constricted of a budget. So the game really does for the most part, it's only, it only crashed me twice. One of those times proved fatal. The second time was nothing. It just crashed at the beginning of a cutscene. Other than that, the game ran fairly well. Uh, it did have the occasional frame rate issue, so that that's something uh, I'd say that 90% of the time the game ran right, but there was about 10% of the time that it would just randomly have a little bit of hitches. I mean, you know, it wouldn't completely stop, but it would go down into the mid-20s uh, where you can feel it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but outside of that, without spending too much time, the game is just super interesting, and I love that games at least are still at a point where it's easy to one day think, well, we've probably seen some variation of everything there is to do. And you wouldn't think that, okay, let's just take a Ubisoft style game. Uh, essentially you're putting a map, here's all the stuff you can do and you just clear the map out. And that's essentially what the game is about. Yeah. Uh, To the point of even going, which is something that I don't think Ubisoft does enough. You got experience and unlockables for unlocking all the map stuff. So as you went through into an area and you'd you'd slowly 100% that area, if you found all of the landmarks, which were all great Easter eggs, by the way, there was a rest of development Easter egg in their frozen banana stand underwater, uh, which was fantastic. And the little landmark name for it was there's always money here, which is just the, great. Yeah. I love that so much. Um, but with that, whenever you'd find an area and you'd find all of the landmarks within that area, you'd get an evolution from it. So you'd actually get something you could go back and use, plus getting experience and nutrients that you need. And since each evolution is broken into leveling up with different nutrients required, it, it was a great way to make the exploration feel like you're doing more than just exploring the world. It's like, oh, this is actually helping me build a better shark and also give me options. As weird as it is to say that you have builds in a game where you're a shark, you actually can go through... And as you level up, it gets more and more powerful. And it even has, it has set bonuses. So, like, if you get shadow fin and you're already using a, sh- a shadow uh, head and a shadow tail and maybe a shadow teeth, then you get more and more percentage extra damage or extra effect out of it, which is just a fun extra layer of gameplay to kind of pull into something like that. So, really, I enjoy that there are games that are still finding ways to be unique. You where I was going earlier is if you take a Ubisoft game, essentially by all intents and purposes, 
you don't think it'd be such a huge difference to be like, well, you're going to play it as a shark. But just by making it a shark and forcing you to change your primary environment to water, that means your entire game has got up and down 360 control, Yeah, uh, which is interesting. And the challenge to, over, to overcome, and I think they did a really good job at it. It's not perfect, but it's really, really good. Hmm. And, of course, the amount of times I've played games with bad swimming mechanics, really, really good is, is a lot better than plenty of games. Kingdom Hearts, <laughs> Kingdom Hearts 1. Yeah. And then you also rip uh, when you also put into uh, the that just how much the water landscape changes. You know, it's it it is a nice change of pace. It's like you're used to seeing luscious forests and stuff, but it's like when you t- when you kind of put all that underwater, it's like you don't think about the way that water goes down. It, it's like a valley becomes your mountain. It's like oh, this is deep. Let's go see what that is. I'm gonna go down instead of climbing up. Mm-mm. Not for you because you're scared of depth. Yeah, <laughs> I shouldn't say scared, but I mean, I guess that is the technically if nothing else you're uh, cautious of depths yeah um but yeah I, I just really enjoyed it that's uh, essentially for the price that i got it at it's 40 dollars, which i think it's totally worth 40 dollars. i got it at walmart for 33 dollars, and i had a 25 dollar gift card uh that we found from when we got married <laughs> we found nice. it hidden somewhere and i was like well sweet so uh yeah Fantastic game, but moving on to that, one thing that we both played, though you not near as much as I have now, is Minecraft Dungeons. I haven't beaten it, but I played it more since we played. Good, yeah. Um, I have beat it. I've almost beat it on the second difficulty, and me and Sean are working on getting to the third difficulty. The game is hard for soloing. Like, like uh, I, it, your build matters so much. Yeah, more. yeah. Like I was playing through the. Um, Ah, uh, there's the soggy swamp, and then there's the uh, the other one that's pumpkin uh, pasture. Yeah, pumpkin pasture. Um. Those two levels are pretty hard, especially Soggy Swamp's boss in that level. So are like, you replaying solo. levels to get better gear? We never played through Soggy Swamp together. Yeah, we did. No, we didn't. Then why did we do this thing? And I guess we played in a weird order. I don't think there is an order. Yeah. <laughs> is there? From a difficulty standpoint. Oh, well, um, yeah. No, we played through like the creeper the creeper <laughs> farm thing. We played through um, uh, the cactus one, I think. Mm-hmm. The redstone mines and like one yeah. more. Soggy Swamp's like the second level. Oh well, yeah, we definitely. And they get, and that's that's hard by yourself. Let me tell you, <laughs> that boss that keeps just throwing out slimes and ch- they're enchanted. Yeah, a lot of the bosses uh, utilize uh, ads. Like they yeah. all throw out ads, which can be great, but can also depending on your build, can be bad. It can yeah. it can do a lot of good because then when you do occasionally run across one boss that doesn't have ads, if you have a build that's built around using ads to get things that you need, it's like ooh. Uh, but now I just want to play Minecraft on the hardest difficulty. Oh my god, dude. with like a couple friends. Oh wait, normal Minecraft? Yeah, or, normal okay. Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft Dungeons, though, man. There, uh, here, here's what I'll say: twenty dollars, probably the best twenty dollars I've ever spent. Uh, well, I, I won't say ever, but in a long time. This is reminding me of uh, the depth this game has is not quite the same, but it's edging up in some ways close to something like Diablo three yeah. for a third of the cost. And even then, I'd honestly say. This is, if you think about this at launch versus Diablo 3 at launch, I think this is almost a better value than Diablo 3 was at launch. Diablo 3 got a lot better after Reaper of Souls update hit, and then a lot of the times that required you buying Reaper of Souls, not to get the update, but the content that added yeah. was also good. Um, but when you look at where this is at, my one, like, I, I'm, I'm so impressed with how well it works, how deep it works, how much they pay attention to the genre, even going so far as to... I'll, I'll throw it in there. There is a hidden cow level, which is which important. is Diablo two style it's, of thing. And I'd say that this game is mostly replicating Diablo two, yeah. with some extra polish. Um, I can see that. Even going so far as to use the same names, if I recall right, it, weren't, weren't the legendary items from Diablo three in Diablo two? Weren't they just called unique items? If I remember correctly, I think so. They, they were called unique items, and that's what they're called here, uh, which is special items that you can go through. Now, it is simplified. One of the things I talked about last week when we were calling it the, uh, you know, our uh, interesting game of the week was that yeah. it would be a way for people who are not familiar with the genre to come into the genre. And it is simplified in that manner to where if you want to play on an easier difficulty and go through, you can play. There's not a ton of gear. All your armor is one piece instead of having all your armor be broken up. You just have one piece of armor. That's a full set. And then you have your melee weapon and then you have your ranged weapon, uh, which I also like is that you have melee and range at all times on every character. Yeah. Um, and then you could do a variety of artifacts too. Yes. And so, one of the big changes from this is that in a game like Diablo, you're used to the idea of classes. Mm-hmm. In this game, there is no need for classes because you have 
now and in Diablo you have builds within classes. Yeah, but this game is just builds. But this game is just builds. But that also means that you can kind of be a little bit of everything. You know, I mean, it's it's great. Uh, right now, I'm rocking a soul based build where you can kill enemies. And once you have weapons that can get you an armor that helps you get more souls, you kill enemies and you get souls from it. Uh, and then you have a, a bar at the bottom that shows those souls, and you can expend them to do a number of different things. So right now, I'm essentially a battle mage. I do use my sword to kill up close melee. It's a, it's a scythe, actually. Um, get souls that way. I also have a bow that can get me souls that does stuff. Then I can use those souls to either heal myself and the whole party or to just blow out massive damage. Yeah. Uh, so I'm loving it right now, and... The intricacy of the builds is really fun. Uh, and the enchantment system that comes in is just another layer of the depth. Every item, uh, well, except for your artifacts, which would be kind of cool in the long run, but all of your main three items can have up to three different enchantment suites on them for you to choose from and spend enchantment points into. Uh, so I'll just say, if this sounds like a game that's interesting to you and if you've liked any of the dungeon crawlers and want maybe one that's a little more accessible... Uh, this is the way to go. It's very good. Also, Saul is... Uh, I hit the thing on my watch thinking it was... Because I'm still not used to the notification thing, so I hit that thing that's vibrate. No, that was pinging my phone. Ah, okay. <laughs> so in, in, in an effort to try to silence my device, I made it ring louder. <laughs> well, you should definitely play more with us. Uh, Blaze bought the game last night, and we almost got him through the entire of the story. The because, base game? Yeah, because we're just flying through. Because once you get into adventure mode, new gear comes out, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So it's like, why waste time uh, trying to get perfect your build on this mode? If we can just fly, fly you through, you can start an adventure mode and start getting good builds. Is um, It's four players, right? Or is yeah. it three? Okay. Four. Cool. So we can all play together. It'll be very fun. If anybody else wants to play... Hit up your boy. There is one thing I'd like to talk about before we move on completely. The game is a little bit buggy. It's not terrible, but uh, if, you, frame rate drops. if you pick up the game, I would advise that you never join in on somebody mid-mission. Um, we had it happen multiple times, so it's replicable. Uh, if Sean would join me mid-game, uh, it would um, start making my audio cut out when a lot of enemies would come through, all the way to the system level. Me and Sean's party, the the audio would cut out and drop in quality and sound like a really old phone call, Weird. and it would start and it would pop every time I'd do it, and it got worse the more enemies that were on screen. Uh, then a separate time that he joined me mid battle, because at first I thought maybe it's just my PlayStation or the game just was weird and it was just my end. Um, Sean and I both had the issue of it start making your screen look like you punched your TV with like purple and black blocks popping up randomly. Like when your TV starts to fail. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, always join from the camp and then start that way. Uh, and you will have a much better time. Uh, there is occasional times that the game also, this only happened once actually, where we finished a mission and instead of taking us to the reward screen where you get the extra chest, the game just got stuck in load. But to their credit, when we exited the game and came back, as soon as we loaded into the game, it gave me the, the loot reward and it gave Sean the same thing once he joined into my world. So it was hmm. like, we know you did it and you didn't get it, so we're still going to give it to you. Yeah. So uh, last bug I'm having right now is, of course, I'm working on the Platinum for this really great game. Uh, and the trophy I know that I've gotten and uh, I know that I've met the requirements for probably twofold by now, uh, if not more, is a trophy called Omnom Nom. It's a food-based trophy. You got to eat 200 pieces of food. I've eaten probably 600 at this point, and the trophy won't proc. Hmm. Um, so I'm waiting for a patch, and then I'm hoping that there's some things you can do to speed that up. Um, unless the trophy is not described well, because it just says eat 200 pieces of food. I hope maybe it, the part of the problem is that you have to eat 200 pieces of food when you actually are not don't have health and you need to heal. Maybe it doesn't count food that you eat when you're at full health. But I feel like it should because food gives you regeneration. Yeah. Which even if you're at full health when you eat it, two seconds later while you're in your 30 seconds of, or whatever, you get hit, then it heals you. So it feels weird, but right now I will not be able to plat the game, which is fine because I won't plat the game until I beat it on a, uh, Apocalypse Mode anyway. So if they patch it by then and fix it, I'm happy. Hmm. But something to think about, I still think it's a really great game, and I would love to play with anybody who has interest when I can, uh, which has been a lot lately. So uh, either way, uh, what have you been playing besides that? Did you play anything else? Uh, I still played a little bit of Skyrim. Um, but that's pretty much it, other than the uh, Master Chief Collection on PC. Uh, yeah. Played through that yesterday with my buddy Seth. Um, did you ever hear about the infamous Scarab gun in Halo 2? Mm-hmm. 
when Master Chief Collection came out, I don't know if this was like only on PC or if this they updated it. I don't remember this in the Xbox. Halo 2 Anniversary has a scarab gun skull. So every, everything you shoot is a scarab gun. I don't remember. Yeah, so that's cool. We put on, I never played Master Chief Collection on Xbox, actually. You didn't? Uh, oh. I played it at Blaze's house for a couple matches of uh, Halo 4 Online. That was about it. Well, we put on scarab gun. Uh, skull, and then we put on the Sputnik skull, which makes all the explosions uh, have high, higher radiuses and le- and zero or not zero, but lower gravity. Yeah. So like it, you could grenade jump really far and stuff. So we put that on, and we were playing through the campaign with that, and it's pretty fun. Do the campaigns automatically have all the skulls unlocked, or did, were it, was it because you were you, playing? You with could Seth? turn on all the skulls, but then you could also go grab skulls. Great. So like you could because turn them all on, or you could just go grab them yourself. Replaying them. As a matter of fact, I think that there's a, a there's an achievement that you can get for getting all the skulls, and there's an achievement for each skull. Okay, that yeah, that's cool. But replaying them, as much as I like that element of them back in the day, replaying them, I just want to use the skulls rather than having to go find them again. Personally. Yeah, yeah, you could so. just switch them all on. Like we had that one. We had on the grunt funeral. Uh, which is like where a grunt dies, they explode. Yeah. We had on the grunt birthday party, which didn't make sense because you can't get headshots with scarab guns. Um, but we had on like everything. We were just running through levels on heroic, just blast everything. Is grunt birthday party the one that makes their heads bigger? No, it's when or you the headshot, the... they explode into confetti. Okay. And you hear that yay yeah. thing. I couldn't remember. I was like, I know that there was. Is there one that made heads bigger? No. You Maybe they might golden eye, DK mode. I, know, I remember golden eye, but I thought a lot of shooters have kind of dabbled with that Mm-mm. in the earlier like late 90s early 2000s no, but not, i can't even remember were there skulls in halo one i don't think so that was added it in was two in halo and three. two and three yeah. yeah either way that's cool um and you know what now that i've i figured now those games are on computer i have an xbox i guess i could just play there and cross play probably if still you have exists. games pass well they don't cross play yet it can cross play like Steam and Windows Store on computer, but they have not added cross play for Xbox and PC yet. Mm. They haven't done that because all of the games are not available on PC yet. Fair. Halo 3 is not out yet. Are they still doing the thing for that where, uh, at least at launch, when you played the game, the multiplayer was not. It was broken up by like playlists of games. I don't know. We and played it was matchmake within we, those. We or could like, you specifically say I want to play Halo 2's multiplayer the way that it was? See, I don't know because I we played two hours of multiplayer yesterday, and Seth was kind of the party leader, so he was kind of doing all that. But we got, from what I remember, we played pretty much all Halo 2. Like okay. it was all Halo 2, and then Halo 2 Anniversary. Um, so I, I think you can select the games. Cool. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. In early days, it was just playlist. Like you couldn't say I wanted to play Halo 4's online so much as you'd say I want to play Halo 4 maps, and I think that. It was also broken. I like, don't know. It was very weird. The matchmaking yeah. was broken or something. Yeah. So either way, that's cool. Um, I, I guess I should mention to Kiki, who was mad that I uh, threw off uh, the evil within because of its... He said I was hating on the structure of chapters. I'm not hating on it. It's just not a preferred thing for me. Yeah. Uh, I think that what I was trying to get at, and I may have even said last week with that, is that chapters sometimes show the age or make a game feel older because as we move forward, you're so used to not seeing chapters. You just see game things go for, uh, go seamlessly through uh, a good example of that. That's kind of weird. Is like, uh, some games like uh, the, the uh, Xenoblade Chronicles two is a good example of a game that had cut scenes in the game, but because the switch is weaker and, and doesn't have as easy of a, of a option of showing you in game cut scenes, like the PS4 is done with pretty much every game now and the Xbox as well. Um, the Switch version of, or the Switch version, the Switch on Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has pre rendered cutscenes. So in the DLC for uh, Xenoblade 2, when you have a change in outfit, you don't see it in the cutscenes. That's a thing that shows age of games to me, too. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, pre rendered cutscenes are so old. It's like, why are they even in games anymore? Because they're not needed. I think it looks so much more natural. When the all the cutscenes take place in the game, yeah, and it's like I don't need this like like, like old Final Fantasy games. It's like I I see, I see these characters, and I had this with Final Fantasy VII that chose to use pre rendered cutscenes occasionally, where I'm like, Cloud in the game to me looks better than Cloud in pre rendered cutscene, even though the pre rendered cutscene has more detail. For some reason, in pre rendered cutscenes for Japanese games, they always make the characters' features more rounded off, yeah. and soft. And it's just like, why would you do that? Cloud looks perfectly fine in game. The engine can handle plenty. Blocky, just, if you might, if you might suggest. Yeah, j- just play the game. I <laughs> just, it, you don't have that disconnect that comes. Like you know, when you're young, you didn't care because it's kind of like 
it was going to be hard to show off some of the things you needed in game engine, but now that's not a problem. So that shows age. And I think chapters do too, because something about modern time, what you kind of expect from modern games is like endless play where you're not seeing a chapter break. Now I think it depends on the genre. Of course, Minecraft dungeons has got levels, but that's a staple of that genre. Right. I don't think that chapters are a staple of the horror genre and definitely not in an enclosed section. It's fine. I'll play it. I played through chapter two of the evil within. So I've gotten farther than I think I ever have in the game. Uh, it's it, hard to remember exactly, but, uh, then Minecraft, well, then Man Eater took all my attention, and then my, now Minecraft Dungeons has taken all my attention to remind me that I am really bad about just playing one, one game, game at a time and getting yeah. super engrossed into it as long as it's good. So, But uh, I guess that means that it's time to move over into what our community's take was. And Saul, since you spearheaded this one, I want to let you kind of uh, jump off with it. Sure. Wherever so, you see fit. of course, every episode we ask you guys, a question that we want you to answer, then we'll feature your answers on our episode. And last week I asked you guys to give us your spiciest gaming take, the hottest take you can muster. And uh, for those that need a uh, reminder, uh, hot takes are typically things that you think will be disagreed upon. We got a lot of agreements. Um, even though there's a couple of things that, uh, in here I agree on, I'm sure, or disagree on, I'm sure you disagree on a couple of them sure. too. Uh, we'll start with the first one in Discord where our good buddy and patron El Chabib said, Spiciest gaming take is GTA 4 slash 5, Red Dead Redemption 2, and The Witcher 3 are overrated, overbloated games. I could I could agree. I could see how you could get to that. I don't know if I could agree to that, but I could see that I could see the reasoning behind this. So it's weird. I I agree and disagree with this sentence all at the same time. I do think that they are it's weird. I do think all the games are personally overbloated i think there's way too much to do in each one of these games um but with that said i think with as much as there is to do in the witcher 3 uh i'm gonna use that game as my pure example on this one as much as there is to do in the witcher 3 i think most of it the overwhelming majority of it adds to the game and the story in a way that i think makes it worth being there i think red dead redemption 2 has got some things that I don't necessarily know if they lend themselves better to the final overarching story, but they definitely lend them. They lend themselves to feeling a little bit more part of just being in a old Western world, which that just depends on what you want out of the game. Do you want a, a an experience that builds upon the world and the story that you're saying within that world? Or do you just want something that kind of gives you the sim feeling of, Oh, I'm going to go drink at a bar and punch some guys and just ride around and be a cowboy. Like it doesn't, it's not part of the game, but I guess it is building the world. And, I'll say and if that, that's what you're looking for, then it again, overbloated. I, yeah, I do think that there's, a, I would say personally, too much to do, but I know some people just want that. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what it comes down to is a hot take is just a matter of opinion. And yeah. some people don't like that there's that much to do in a game. They, they may think that there's so much to do. Um, that there was so much to focus on in development for every single thing that you could do. They never truly perfected one aspect of any of that. Fair. Uh, yeah. So I will get into another one though on discord. Uh, Jason S this is a really spicy one. He says, we don't need free games for PS plus every month. I pay to be able to play online. Having free games every month is a quote unquote plus. Then he goes to say that Red Dead Redemption <laughs> 2 is the most overhyped game he's ever played. I yeah. like, I like that. He decided to punt it out with plus. Yes. Now, I will say, Jason, not everybody plays online, <laughs> but that is a that is a hot take for sure, because I think that a majority of people who look forward every month to see what the games are, they are the ones that are really want to download it and stuff. Um, meanwhile, there are people who pull it, who have it just to play online like they they that's all they care about where there are some people who have it and they're like, I, I use it to play occasionally, but I realistically want to see what those games are every month. So I think part of where this lands, I kind of see his argument <laughs> in a weird way. Yeah. I think part I mean, I of where too. this lands is depending on when you came into PS Plus. As someone who's been a PS Plus, Plus subscriber literally without lapse since the PS3. Yeah. Since it before, literally started. Before PS Plus was a th was a or well, not PS Plus, the PS Plus games were a thing. Uh, well, PS Plus games were a, were a part of it from the get-go. Was it? I thought yeah. that was like three months later that those became a thing. No, I'm pretty sure it was from launch uh, because it, oh, wow. it was monthly games. Uh, there wasn't a direct quantity like eventually it came. It's just like you're going to get free games sometimes. Um, 
the and then it came with the uh, the uh, it was fifty dollars a year at that point still too, and it came with excuse me automatic update for PS3, uh, and then backup saves for cloud games, which at that point in time systems didn't do. Uh, so that was cool. That was a good thing. So to me, the service was kind of like you don't need this at all. But if you like the Here's a plus. convenience, yeah, exactly. And that's why I think the name was so genius, really. It's like if you want the convenience of automatic update, you've got it. If you want the convenience of cloud backup saves, you've got it. And we handle it for you automatically. Yeah. If you like the if you like the convenience of getting some free games that you may have never played before, you've got it. And that's what sold me on it. I was like, this is a great thing to try. So I bought a year. I said, it doesn't hurt to try. And I really liked it, so I just kept it. And then at that time, that was still when they used to do this thing, which I kind of miss, which was, um, I think it, at the time, it was called the Instant Game Collection, because what would happen is as soon as you became a PS Plus member... There was like 10 pre There were games, games that were ever... Well, I won't say evergreen, but they would be part of PS Plus for like two years. It was like that on Vita. Like yes. Gravity Rush, Drake's Uncharted, um, Fortune... Um, well, uh, yeah, Un- Uncharted, well, Golden Abyss. Golden Abyss, yeah. Yeah. And stuff like that. Those were always free like if yeah. you're a ps plus you could go download those no matter what yeah and i think on playstation it was like uncharted three two i don't think it was three it, three it was, may have been part of it eventually I thought, okay. uh, yeah because again they they would rotate out every now and then. yeah uh but like infamous two or infamous one one of those was one of them it was just cool to see that it was like oh you just you hop in and you've already got 10 games to play it was almost kind of like the idea for what eventually became games pass it's like you pay for it and we're going to rotate games in that uh, every, every month that you get but we're also going to keep games that are just as soon as you join the service you have these five ten whatever it be games to just play yeah uh and for so for me the idea of it being like well now you're going to pay for online i mean yeah i pay for it so i can play online but if i'm being honest i still pay for it realistically for the same benefits that i paid for it when i started it and, yeah. and because I was already going to keep that, I've never had to worry about not being able to play online for that to have been my reasoning behind it. I do wish that PS Plus was... It was I wish that both PS Plus and Xbox Live weren't tied to online in a way. I wish that the online was free like it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I wish that um, you could do uh, a, 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 like literally PS Plus. Let's, let's back up for a split second. Just because of curiosity. I don't know because I never personally did it uh, on my own system because I didn't get an Xbox until like right when the 360 was coming out. Mm-hmm. And I never played online on, on, on my own system. Was online free on Xbox original? I don't think so. I think Xbox has I remember always been a paid service. I remember buying cards for Xbox Live back then, but I don't remember if you had to or like what I was doing with them. Like, um, I think it was all, it's always been Xbox Live Gold since it first started, right? I don't remember. <laughs> it's been so long. That's just a, it was just a curiosity because PS2 was entirely free, PSP entirely free, PS3, PS3 was entirely, was entirely free, free, PS Vita entirely. Yeah, free. and then then they went to the dark side and started charging. I wish that both both of these companies wouldn't charge at all. Uh, PC gaming doesn't have that problem. You don't have to pay any one service. Yeah, like it's that just to extra play online. income for them, and I don't blame them honestly. But I don't blame I, them. But I'm just saying I wish it go back to the yes, golden age of the two. The I always thought that the better choice. Though, of course, it means that you're going to get naturally less people because of it. I always thought the, the the reason I was such a fan of PS Plus was, to me, it was just like, are you a fan? Do you like these extra conveniences? We're not forcing this on you so that you're you're not, we're not locking anything behind a paywall. Not that you'd be... Well, not, multiplayer. Well, not, yeah, well, now they are. But I'm saying back in when it started in PS3, it was just, do you want some extra crap that is not as pertinent? It's like online gaming, you expect as part of your console. Now is a little different nowadays you expect and it's still part of ps plus nowadays you kind of expect um cloud backups and all that thing though i would say that's not free on pc you don't get free cloud backups on pc it depends on how you do it uh i mean maybe certain games will do it for you for free but it's not a universal thing it depends on how you do it one drive well yeah but that's not free that's you you only have so much and you have to sign up it's not part of the native because I, because PC is a broader well, I platform. My Windows, and I don't know if it's because I, I bought Windows 10 Pro or what. I have free unlimited in OneDrive. Never oh, I don't have unlimited. Mine's constantly saying how it's full. Oh, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that on my laptop. I've also before. never backed anything up to OneDrive. It just does it for me. Me neither. And then, but it doesn't now for the last three years because my OneDrive's been full for three years because I don't care. I've actually it. disabled it. Uh, my but my, PC, my point but, generally being is 
I like the idea of PS Plus better than Xbox Live on during the 360 PS3 era because it felt more like here's a way for us to make extra money from people who like us enough to want to get this uh, extra thing, but they also get some value out of it. The problem with the forced for online play is it kind of feels a little more dirty. Yeah. And it felt even more dirty. And I don't know if, play, if uh, sorry, I don't know if Xbox and Microsoft have changed this, but it felt even more dirty to me when at the start of the generation, for for sure, the Xbox One required you to have online to watch Netflix. I was like, come on, guys. And you have to have online to play, free to play online games. Did PS3 have that too? No. Where Netflix was just free. Netflix has never been behind a paywall on PlayStation ever. Okay, so it's just you could, as long that. as you have a Netflix subscription, you can watch Netflix. So Xbox had that, and I think they still do. I'm actually I, I've not seen where they've changed it, and I think they have changed this. But for a long time on Xbox One, you could not play Netflix on Xbox. You could not play free to play games on Xbox without Xbox Live. If it was a free to play online game, you yeah, still had to have Xbox, Xbox Live. Live. Yeah. But on PlayStation, if it's free to play, you don't have to have PS Plus. Fortnite, you can just play. You don't have to have PS Plus. Yeah. Well, now I think you actually have to have PlayStation Plus for Fortnite. When did that start? When crossplay and stuff happened. Mm. I think I do. I think it has to do with account tying. Um, and I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you do. Um, I'll get well, through. No, it's just an interesting thing to. But go ahead. I'm, it's just an interesting thing to clarify. Um. Back on Discord, though, we do have. No, you do not. And how old is that, though? That's from Epic Games, April 29th, 2020. Okay, I must be thinking of something else then. Yeah. Um, Kevin Bacon said, I'm the only one in my friend group who likes Bloodbone, Bloodbone, Bloodborne over Dark Souls and hates Red Dead 2. We get a lot of Red Dead 2 hate. We're going to get a lot of another game series hate here in a minute, too. Yes. Um, so, Bloodborne over Dark Souls. Um, as a single entity, maybe, yeah, I could see that. I think Dark Souls 3, though, and Bloodborne are still tied. Uh, oh, so me. you're saying like Dark Souls 1 versus Bloodborne? No, I'm thinking of any one Dark Souls game versus D- Bloodborne as a whole. Because you can't really compare three series or three games to, to, a, one. to one. Yeah. So I'm going to take like what I would consider to be highest quality up there. That's Dark Souls 3. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair. We have a long-winded one on Discord from our buddy Josh. He, uh, he has, This is quite... Quite the hot take, in my opinion. He says, Games Pass will be the end of Xbox. It's consumer-facing, but such an expensive thing that will either A, destroy their credibility with the games being forced to take on games as a service models to keep people buying it. Gears 5 said before launch, it didn't affect anything, and after launch, they said it was why they made it the way it was. Not sure what that means. I think he means that there was, and I don't know because I didn't play the game, but it sounds like he's implying that the game was developed with going to Xbox Game Pass day one in mind. Maybe so, so but wasn't Tomb Raider the same way? To, which which one? The Whatever the newest one is. That one's Game Pass day one. Like, aren't all these games developed with that in mind? No, I didn't go to, uh, Tomb Raider didn't go day one, but it was really, really close. I thought it, it was day one. No, I'm pretty sure that's day one. Day, Division two, Tomb Raider, because E3, like two years ago or a year ago, announced all of this. Uh, yeah, you might be right. And if so, I don't know. I mean, but I, I guess I'd say, and, and I don't know, it, it, it goes off of his point more than anything depends on what he particularly meant by it but i take it as if you know your game is not going to sell to as many people yeah. you're going to change certain things to and it, who knows but the implication seems that it'd be you're going to cut corners here and there because why spend the money on something that's not going to make money in the traditional sense it's only going to make money from a subscription sense and I don't know I what effect that would or would prove, not have. Though. It is hard to prove. Um, Very hard. But then he goes to say, point B, um, they won't make the money. They need to sustain their production and have they have 10 million users now. Who knows how many they are paying $1 a month or some even paid $1 for two years in short term. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I don't, I've never There's seen been plenty of mess ups on the thing where you could buy multiple years for a very long time. Oh, okay. Money. In yeah. the short term, the long term project is short sighted and will cost them more money than they make <sighs> by far. Okay. So, so I fundamentally agree with that just because let's say any service, he said 10 million, we'll just cut it to 9 million. Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll say a million users have left in between now and when they ran that number in April. Let's say that they all did one dollar a month, which is unlikely. They all there. Yeah. There are people like me who pay fifteen dollars a month for PC Games Pass Ultimate. Yeah, that's still nine million dollars a month that they're making, and, and from January to October, that's 
a hundred million dollars in revenue. What it comes down to is how much of that. For, it's not revenue. Well, yeah, but still. Well, uh, it is, but it's not. It's it's not. Uh, what is it? Net. It's, it's not net. Because, yeah, it's well, gross. Especially in this in this case, because we're going off of one dollar a month for all nine million users, which it's not, and then we're going off nine million users, which it's we don't know. Yeah. Um. But that's that's still that's that's. An absorbent amount of money. That's not counting game sales. That's not counting Xbox Live users. That's mm-hmm. not counting console hardware accessory sales. I I feel like this is the hottest take that we've gotten because I feel like it's incredibly wrong. <laughs> because th- I don't think Games Pass at all will cause the downfall of anything. I don't know about downfall of anything. Well, that's, I, I think and that's, and I, I think the way. Yeah, I mean, I get what he's saying. It'll either destroy their credibility, but he's saying it. Games Pass will be the end of uh, Xbox. If anything, I think it. I think, and again, th- I can only put so much intent on it. But having co- had the conversation I've had with Josh in regards to this, uh, in multiple times, depending on you know, based off of multiple different catalysts for conversation, I think what he means is it's the end of Xbox, at least as they're known as a console thing. Like I think he sees it making them move towards something that is not what they have been known for since they've entered. The, I don't the game. think it's destroying any credibility, mm-hmm. though. Yeah, I don't know about that either. That- I'd say this. My take on Games Pass is that I'm so – there's so many questions to be had that I don't know that any business would ever put out there uh, and that we're going to have to kind of wait and see until – Like like 10 years down the road or something. Well, yeah, not maybe not even 10, maybe 5, but the reason I say that well, it's is, already been It's almost already been active for 5. It's been active for 3, hasn't it? Didn't Games Pass come out in 2017? That sounds right. So it's almost yeah. been 5. Yeah. Uh, Though it's grown substantially in the last year and a half, I'd say, yeah. in terms of games on it and user count. Yeah, yeah, up to um, 10 million people in April. Yeah, and I, so. And, and I was, you know, I was going to be very generous and cut a million people off there. I doubt a million people have unsubscribed, but then again, it's you'd never know. Yeah. They, they're secret with their numbers, and they're, they're not secret with their numbers because they suck. They're secret with their numbers because they don't have to be out there with it. I've said before, I don't like it when, when game, like people celebrate numbers in any form of company because it's not. You don't have a stake in it. It's kind of just like it's it's just weird bragging rights. Like, oh, Sony has an install base of this many. <sighs> okay, how does that? I mean, I get it. I, and the way I say it, and I, I oh, hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll address that and then go back to my Games Pass thing. But for that in particular, the reason I'm like, oh, it's exciting that PlayStation has 120 million PS4s out there. No, no, uh, no. You're, you're twisting what I'm saying, though. Say next generation, Sony messes up. Xbox oh, okay. has more people. Somebody yeah. says, well, Xbox has 600 million people online right now. Oh, okay. What, what do you say to that? Okay, like good, good, so for, you, good for them? What, I guess what numbers are you talking about? So you don't mean like sales, you mean like I actual mean, I, users? Say somebody user says counts? Xbox sold 600 million Xbox in response to you saying I like PlayStation. Good for oh, Xbox? Yeah, no, that's, that, like, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I get that. that, that well, that's, that's, that's what I don't like when people yeah. go about and they're like, well, Sony has this, Xbox has this, PC has this. Well, good for them, I guess, but that's... Yeah, I thought you were just saying like when someone's like, oh, dude, isn't it cool that Sony sold no, 120 million no, consoles? No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about yeah. when people go overboard with it and they're like, well, that well, Xbox is going to fail because they got this or Sony's going to fail yeah. because they got this. It's like, cool. I guarantee you Last of Us is not going to fail because of dislikes it has on Reddit. Yeah, no, it's like, not. <laughs> like, yeah, like... Actually, we'll get into that in the news in a minute. But going back to Games Pass, my final kind of thing on it is that we, we kind of still need to learn more about how it's going to go, but I don't know if we ever will because of, they don't need to be open with it, so why would they? Uh, but I'll say this. Right now, we don't know how much of the money that they're making is they're actually taking in as profit on their company level versus how much they're making from the revenue is going back out to pay the people who are putting their games on it. Because what can happen is as they're trying to build it, and that might may, could be what's happening, it could not be, but as they're trying to build it, they may be taking a little bit of a loss on themselves or making very little profit themselves so that they can pay more to developers to incentivize more developers and more publishers to put their games on earlier and for longer extents of time or put games that would otherwise not be on there like Grand Theft Auto 5 yeah. on for a couple of months because it's like, well, while you know this game has sold 150 million or whatever yeah. copies, uh, you can get a couple more people who play and may end up buying it after it leaves or indie games for me is like I, da- games, yeah. I downloaded the long dark on there. Oh yeah, like a week uh, and a half ago or two weeks ago. There's a little snow like hunting survival game. Yeah, yeah, survival, I, yeah. I wouldn't have bought that game, but yeah. I'm gonna download it for them. And like, like I guarantee you that they paid that company enough money to make sure that the people who would have 
lost they would have lost revenue from if i would have never bought it at all or compensated in that equally and that goes to my next thing we don't know how companies are paid but by the end of the day the company accepts the offer yes which means yeah, that absolutely. it's good enough for them to accept yes. it yes. so like they, they, i don't find there's argument in well they could have made more like th- because of if they didn't it's like well they they wouldn't have accepted the offer if they projected that well, it's right. also one is guaranteed income potentially. Again, it depends on the deal. So first thing about that is it's not mutually exclusive. Even though the game is on Games Pass, doesn't mean that the game is still not purchasable. And there are people who just don't want Games Pass but may want this game who will buy the game full out price for whatever right. reason yeah, they yeah. see fit. Then on top of that... I'm talking about that, for the people who, who have yeah. Games Pass who, like me, I would have never bought the game and paid money for it because it's just not something that interests me enough yeah, to pay money on it. But then I've, it's part of a subscription. Of course I'm going to download it. Yeah. So to that... Uh, it depends on the deal that's made. Uh, I think it, it's been hinted at that with PS Plus, when they put games on there, uh, they give a lump sum that gives them guaranteed money. And on top of that, they pay them a little bit more for each person that downloads They the pay game. them royalties for downloads, I'm pretty sure. Okay, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Uh, so with that, it's kind of like, well, you're taking a little bit of a chance, but the chance is kind of like, well, if more people try the game and we get royalties from it being downloaded then putting it in front of more people's face so that they can go, there's no cost in it, let me just download it, may mean that the game becomes more lucrative than it otherwise would have been, or at bare minimum, it washes. And it's like, well, why does it matter if it was on there if we still made roughly the same projected yeah. amount of money? And well, that's that's why I said that that's probably the spiciest hot take. Because Sony does the exact same thing minus first-party release day of with yeah. PS Now. And people seem, they like... They're both excellent bundles for what you get and what you pay monthly for. Yeah. Uh, they're very different. They, and that's they're the very one. different. Yeah. One's a streaming service that has like a good amount of downloads and the rest is just downloads. Yeah. And it depends on the on, on the person. You know, Do you have good internet enough to stream games? No. Do you have an Xbox and a PlayStation? Because it might be better to go to Games Pass. But do you care for PlayStation first party games? Because there are some first party games on PS Now, like Horizon. Yeah. Uh, um, and they're, that- both, they're both very solid services. And I think that that's why it's the the spiciest gaming hot take is because the 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 prediction of the impact it'll have on it I think is is the most unagreeable part. I'm looking to see if someone mentioned it. Point of the hot take, and I don't see it. A good hot take. It may be somewhere else. I'm not sure, Uh, but I'll say um, I'll say that my last word on that is the reason that I think all that is so scary is if you look at the closest analog we have to something else that went streaming and, and not the closest analog, I guess it's a, it's an analog, but there's also streaming TV, which has variable success rates. Yeah. But streaming music has really hurt the the music industry. No, it hasn't hurt the music industry. It, it hurts it's hurt the, the artist. Which is the the music industry doesn't exist without the artist. Right. So yeah, it, it hurts the source of the industry. It hurts the source of the industry, but it, like, it and that's the worry here. And that's what, that's what I mean. When people look at that and they see that artists are definitely bigger artists are, are one are very, I'm trying to think of the word to use. I will say but though, there's a, there's a big they're compensated a lot less than they were, but here's the thing that you don't think of. You don't think of the royalties that get paid by the streaming service which factors in that conversation or the YouTube views that is owned by their music videos. They get it. So like Taylor Swift mm-hmm. Vivo channel is probably pulling in more money with that and streaming services combined than album sales alone. I don't know, man. Cause you're talking about who buys CDs you're, anymore, you're, but you're well, it's not, only a very niche people buy music anymore. Well, I buy every album I listen to that I like, I buy and I normally buy well, it on vinyl, even but five years not, ago, buy it. five years ago, it was very, unwar- now, that's me. I, right. I'm not saying but I'm the very niche part of yes. pe- normal like people listening to music, but there's more money in a single CD sale than in millions of streams. That's the problem. It's not millions it's, of YouTube videos, though. I mean, I mean, YouTube's money's a little bit better, but it's not much better. It's still it's still pennies on the dollar. Some, no, no, it's, it's, I mean, like crazy pennies you, on the dollar. You like might want to change that to pennies on the view and then have like a million views and it still be... Well, I get what you're saying, but even one view is like... Point zero 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 three five six. Well, it, cent. that's not the same. That that's different for every CPM. That's different for every YouTube channel. People will say like, "Oh, streaming services are killing music." When in reality, music right now is doing better than it has ever done. It's weird. It's like it's doing. And again, that's why I say it's it's hard to completely say it. 
music is more accessible than ever. More artists get seen because of streaming. Yep. But everybody as a whole makes less money than they used to. But more people are making money because of music because of it. Exactly. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's lopsided. But that, And there's nothing in the gaming industry that we can really compare that to. Because exactly. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. Um, so... Discord check done. We'll move on to Twitter. Twitter has some fun stuff in here that I'm going to read all very close together. Um, our good buddy Hussein, he says that each and every Final Fantasy is good, even 8 and 13. And Vaughn is worthy of being the true protagonist of 12, and his role is essential in that game. I agree with that. I agree uh, with the Vaughn take for sure. And I do think... Final Fantasy, dude. First of all, before we go any further, no, no, I'm gonna why read are, in a very specific. Why order. are all of them? I'm gonna read this in a very specific order because this is all of Twitter. Okay. Okay. Well, look, I'll say Final Fantasy. All of them. There's some hot takes in here that are good. Are good. I'll, I'll say that all of them are mostly some form of good, but there is a very inconsistent quality. Is the one I'll yeah, say. Yeah, that is true. Um, Rick Vagabond says Final Fantasy 13 and 13 2 are excellent, and I can agree to 13 for sure. I don't, I can't say 13 2. I never played this the 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 rest of the uh, trilogy. Um, it's much more like 13 than 13 3 was. So 13 3 was nothing like 13. It's same character, same story, but the combat completely changed. Was the the, uh, completely Lightning changed. wasn't the main character of 13 2, was it? Was she? I mean, yeah, I didn't beat it, so but I've heard plenty about it, and I did play a little bit of it. Okay, uh, but it, it was like thirteen if you if you took most of the complaints from thirteen and tried to address them. Okay, very in quality, but you tried to address them. Like the game was much more open, which was a huge complaint in Final Fantasy thirteen. Okay, I so. can see that. Uh, then we <laughs> then we have Dennis Kevin Bacon bits again. He says Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch is a better JRPG. Than any of the Final Fantasy games. That's a hot take. You have just made a lot of people angry. You no, know, no, but yeah, I guess that's true too. But you have also just made, uh, and I don't know why I'm suddenly blanking out on the developer's name for uh, Nino. Kuni. Level five. Level five. You've made level five so happy. You right did. Now. <laughs> uh, I do like. I do like Nino Kuni. Don't get me wrong. I still need because that remastered I, game I came out, didn't it? I didn't play it, but yes, dude, it you did. gotta play the first one. It's simple. It's easy game. It's it's, it's so good. It's long. Though. Every conversation I've had with somebody is like the game is just drags ass, and I don't care for that. I mean, for a JRPG. Hold on. And if I'm going to say anything, that's the thing. No hate on Nino Cooney at all. But personally, not all Final Fantasies, but personally, Final Fantasy yeah, normally 45 hours for moves JRPG better, is about normal. Yeah, but it's about the pacing within the story. Seth was playing it, and he went from loving it one week to kind of being like, well, it's still good the next week to the following week being like, I have not, I've stopped playing completely because the he, game does not respect well, your time at all. Seth doesn't have good attention span on long games like Even that, that but exactly what he's describing is exactly what I was worried about from seeing the gameplay. The game just, the game, and a lot of games do this. Dragon Quest is another where it's just a hundred some hours because it wants everything to be ma majorly important when it doesn't need to be. Technically, Elder Scrolls games do that too. Not the main storyline. And that's when you start going to outer stuff. Like a perfect example is like Persona Five. Persona I mean, every, Five is a long game in general. If you just play the, if you play yeah. what's required for the main story, you're still talking ninety to hundred hours. Right. For what I view personally as no reason, and actually, apparently they view similarly because Persona Five Golden or Persona Royal. Five Royal rather makes the base game so much shorter. Well, my thing is though is that with what Elder Scrolls does, especially in Oblivion and in Skyrim, is that Everything that you do in that game, every faction and every main story of those two games, you are the one. And every one of them is, I'd say, about four and a half hours long. You have Thieves Guild, Dark Brotherhood. You have the main quest. You have the Mages Guild. So let's all just say that they're about four and a half hours long for the for the for the guilds, and then the main quest is like what about ten hours long somewhere in there twelve That's hours. That's longer than that, but they're normally I'd say they're normally you add it all together fifteen hours about, about forty hours of gameplay there, not yeah. count the little stuff in between. You're doing it, yeah, but I do mean main. Uh, and uh, just to clarify my position, I do mean main story. If I can start Skyrim and beat the entirety of Skyrim in twenty hours, uh, in, in main story, main story. Yeah. Uh, main. Uh, what, what would you even call that? Main, uh, you call it main story, but essentially your campaign that you that most people are going to try and go through. It's the overarching plot line. Right. Okay. 
that 20 hours that's reasonable final fantasy 7 with a little bit of fluff in their recent thing i mean actually a, a, even if you say 10 percent of the game or uh, sorry 25 percent, a quarter of the game 25 percent, that still means that for the most part i'm playing the main story with if you know 10 hours of fluff okay that's not as bad as it could be 40 hours roughly all right and then you go to games like dragon quest where it's like oh to, to play the main campaign and beat the main campaign you're gonna be playing oh, for 80 to 90 you said hours. dragon quest i thought you said dragon age <laughs> Oh no, Dragon Quest. Yeah, and then the same with Persona. Dragon there, Quest. It's it's not that I'm hating on the game so much as I'm saying that is not the way I'm built a game. I don't like that. Yeah, I I, I hate it. Goes much into my thing about it ruins pacings of games. It's See, like that's the whole reason I, I brought need Skyrim to be Oblivion. able to choose, and that's why I, I always look at Skyrim and Oblivion as perfect examples of it. I should be able to choose when I go off the beaten path and make the game longer on my own. Regard. See, I thought you brought up a Western RPG for some reason. Yeah, I was no. like, well, Skyrim and Oblivion kind of do the same thing as that game. Perfect does. example: that, Witcher Three. If we want to bring up a Western RPG, The Witcher Three is a long game. There's plenty of going not on. Not really a Western but the, RPG, but okay. Made in Poland. Yeah, it's a Western RPG if it's not made in Japan. I mean, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> if we're looking on a map from the United States of America, I'm sorry, where are we at? Well, it depends on where. They're to the west you of us go if you globe? go one direction. They're yeah. to the east of us if you go the other. But listen, my point is, Breaking The news. Witcher 3 being long? All JRPGs not called The Witcher the 3's main campaign's like 30 hours. Is it really? Yeah. That's my point. It's not. It's not some hundred hour epic that's trying to be, and not even epic. It's not. It's not some one hundred hour slog where you've got to spend twenty hours going through <laughs> that's palaces. You got to be an intellectual. Yeah, know. and I technically just hated it on Persona Five, but not in the sense of a, that I hate Persona Five. It's just that's not. That does not sound fun to me. Okay, so we got we got uh, we got the, the hot two, take inspired a bunch. We got the two hot take uh, Final Fantasies out the way uh, for positive. Now we're gonna go into Matt. Okay, not Maddie. He says, the Final Fantasy series is overrated. Yes, I do enjoy playing some of them, and they are good games, but I think they are overrated. So, can we talk about the irony that his Twitter tag right now is Matt? Hashtag, hashtag Final Fantasy 7 Remake. I love you, Matt. I love you, too. And I actually appreciate that the hot take was in regards to something he's playing. Because to me, it makes the hot take that much more like, listen, this is I just think, my opinion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I can still like and it. And so far, like, these are good hot takes. Like, these hot takes you're meant to disagree with. They're meant to be uh, something spicy. This next one, though, I think is spicier than Josh's. This English nerd says, competitive gaming as a whole is a toxic cesspit that should not be allowed to exist. Can we stop for a second and, and talk about the fact that their name made it sound like you just, like, bullied them this, like this english, english nerd. nerd over here that, that is kind of yeah <laughs> that is their twitter name yeah. that is their twitter handle uh, i fundamentally disagree with that um i will say though that that is not to say that competitive gaming does not have its definitely toxic moments in it but i will say that i don't think that you should ever try to cancel something just because of uh communities within it because where Games like League of Legends and Dota and Counter Strike are all toxic. You'll find games like, um, like you'll you'll find good matches of all those games, and you'll find good matches of other toxic games like Rainbow Six Siege, or uh, and that is a very toxic multiplayer game. You pick one character wrong, and you pick somebody else wanted it, you'll get vote to kicked out the game. Um, but that doesn't mean that 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 a competitive game doesn't drive competition you know it, it gives you something to do it gives you ranks to look forward to it gives you um a reason to want to get out and play that game instead of you know and and, and leveling up um i played probably 300 hours of league of legends and i never once played um a game with human people up until like 150 hours in i okay. played nothing but bot matches and then I played, uh, you could go co-op, uh, and that's just, it's you and a team of humans versus AI, and I did that a couple times. I didn't know and, that was in the game, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, and then I went and finally played a couple matches of just normal um, 5v5 uh, playing uh, League of Legends. And you can tell right then and there, I was scared to go like play against other people, because it's like, I don't want to play a game and get constantly crapped on, on for not knowing how to play, so I'm going to play bot matches to make sure I'm good. And then I get done with bot matches, and I know my build and my characters' abilities and stuff. I'm yeah. I'm gonna go play them with with other for, like other humans, and then it's just like there's a stigma involved in those games that you know they're bad games, and and I 
solely spent 150 hours into the game playing nothing but the computer for that reason alone. See, as I said, so you're technically leaning toward it, but here's a, a weird flip side, right? And I, I know that you don't agree with it, but you're you're mentioning a situation where you kind of can kind of see what why they think it's no, toxic. No, I definitely can see where yeah. competitive gaming is toxic because it is. It, a majority of te- competitive gaming communities uh, – can be toxic, but then there, there's two can sides be. to yeah. every coin. Well, see, that's, I, that comes out. Is it, is it because the competitive ones that are toxic are just so vocally toxic that it unevenly washes your expectation of competitive gaming depending on where you're looking at it from? No, I would think I, I think people obsess more of neg- negativity. And you will see That's more. True. You'll see more people calling out groups and communities for being negative more so than you'll call positive. them out for being positive. Yeah, it's it's like the whole cheers and jeers ideology. People are way more likely to go and wait and spend time to jeer something. Yeah, than to cheer them. It's and, very rare that someone has a good experience or a normal experience and is just like, you know what? I'm going to go spend five minutes right typing up a very nice review of this. Yeah, place you're not you're not mad and fueled by a bad experience to go do it. Why Yelp is like, you know, well it's Yelp's like, also a paid service sure. or whatever, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like uh, to kind of circle back to the League of Legends, you know, that is if you ask any normal casual gamer who likes multiplayer games, what is the most toxic game? They'll say League of Legends. Never once in that other hundred hours that I played with people that I ever had a bad experience. Oh, once once you were playing online, yeah. openly. Once I like was what so you were scared, kind of of like, scared of. Yeah, I was so scared of like having a bad experience or just how bad this community was, and then I never experienced it myself. Yeah. No, not not to say it's not. It's Which, just in my case, I just never had to work worry about it. Yeah. Well, it goes to show like that. What we said, it's really it's less prevalent than you think, but it's so harped on and noticeable when it does happen. People spend so much time that it makes you unevenly think that all the or the majority of the experience has to be that way. Because yeah. you think if you said you played three hundred hours, right? So you played but, roughly one hundred fifty hours with people, and you never no, in no. Oh, okay. I played roughly a hundred hours on bots only. Okay, but then... And then I played roughly like... Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess technically. Yeah, I was going to okay. say then about 50 hours of people and bots and then the rest of okay. it was... Even then, let's just say 100. In 100 hours of playing a game, if it really was as toxic as you could read about and, and picture from being on forums, you would at least somewhere in that 100 hours have had a bad experience if it was that bad. Yeah. Did you ever and, have one? Uh, no, not that I can remember. And I actually had at least two people add me on friends on that game. And I had one person add me as a friend to help them get better at the game. Oh, nice! Like, like, legitimately, I never, I, I don't typically play with unknown people like that or random people like that. Yeah, I just add them as a friend, and you know, if they ever invite me, I'll hang out and join. But I, I don't like teaching people stuff like that in a game. Like, I didn't have a mic set up or anything. I don't want to type everything out. Um, I did message him a YouTube channel that I was watching, uh, to like show him builds. Yeah, but yeah, like I, I don't think that anything should ever just not be allowed to exist because part of it is bad, especially I, yeah. if there's parts that are that. good. Um, now you could say like. I don't know, like Nazis in the forties. You could say, Oh, there's good in that. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking extreme about examples aside. Yeah, yeah. Extreme examples. aside. I'm talking about specifically gaming instances. Like there's bad in everything. You go to a PlayStation four subreddit, you'll see toxic people. If you go to an Xbox subreddit, you'll see toxic people. If you surround yourself self in any one thing in gaming, you're going to see toxic people in there. And I think that multiplayer style games, whether it's an MMO, a competitive game, a co-op game, it all has such an encompassment in it that you can see um, the good and the bad of it all. Um, co-op games are going to get people who are going to grief in that and just mess around and, and not do anything. You get team-based shooters like Rainbow Six where your teammates kill you and before you even get a chance to get out of the spawn. It's kind of like it's just one of those things where you're going to get bad experiences, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the game should disappear for the people that have good experiences. Sure. You know, just don't play those games. If that's like, I, I quit rainbow six siege because I, how like that game was toxic. If I picked a suit, uh, an operator that was not deemed correct for my spawn on my level, I would is either team killed or t- kicked, uh, or they would try to, uh, kick me. They would do the little vote to boot thing. That's amazing that, that that game has gone on to be as successful, as successful as it was with that kind of. Yeah. And that's on PS4. Been, that's on PS4. Just only, I'm sure it's just as bad in the Xbox and PC. It might yeah. not be though. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so I want to kind of offer a slightly different thing on this one in particular. Competitive is a weird thing. Competitive gaming, most people are going to take towards games that are multiplayer. But you've already expressed interest in the fact that you can have game that you can have a game that is in a sense competitive, but it's not competitive directly with somebody else. It's competitive with the game, but you still get toxicity in those situations, or you still get great moments in those situations. Uh, the instance being like a 
World of Warcraft, right? If you're doing a raid or a dungeon, whatever you want to call it, if you're doing a big raid and it's you against the game, it's not you against other players, but it's you alongside other players, the long-running, really funny Leroy Jenkins joke, if you think about that, that's kind of toxicity. It's somebody coming into something, not taking it seriously, and then people getting mad because someone's not taking it seriously, even though they're not fighting against each other. They're try- they're supposed to be fighting with each other. So you see toxicity across the board. I wouldn't necessarily describe that as being toxic, more so than just like cringy humor. That but- one's trying to be a joke, but my point is there's people who do that without the intent of... There's be- or there's people that do that without the intent of making some video that you put on YouTube. It's people just do it because they're trying to have some dumb well, fun. I mean, yeah, if you do it more than once, yeah, yeah, like, because we've all had, like, I threw TNT at you the other day yes, in Minecraft. It was That's fun. not toxic, yeah. but yeah. But if I kept doing it and you're playing with me and you're like, why does this dude keep doing this? It's not fun. Then it becomes yes, toxic. exactly. Um, but the other side of that goes towards something that Liam uh, talked about, uh, and it can be toxic. You can have competitive gaming that d- exists outside of completely within the games themselves. So right now, uh, the well, it was three of us in the movie podcast. Uh, did somebody leave? No, no, no. It was three of us that were doing... We have a trophies. Uh, we have our own Discord that we just communicate with each other in. And we have a trophy sub thing because we decided that it would be fun to do a trophy competition. Uh, from when we started, which was like March, late March, uh, to the end of the year, who could get the most trophies? Not in a toxic sense. Just like, it'd be fun. You know, we're having fun. Uh, and now Blake is out of it because he sold his PlayStation 4 because he goes through consoles every six months and can't literally keep them. It's like a mental thing with him or something. (laughs) Blake, I hope you're listening. But (laughs) anyway, um, it was me, Blake, and I think Josh wasn't really super into it, but he's kind of like still, he he talks whenever he gets trophies in it, so maybe he's still part of it, I don't know. But me and Chris now are the ones going at it, but it's just dumb jokes, it's competitive, but not to the sense that we're getting mad at each other. I had stopped because I didn't play games for like a full month after getting like eight platinum since we've started this. I just stopped because I wasn't playing any games and didn't really worry about it. And the other day when I started playing Man Eater again and I was like, I'm going for the platinum on this, I just went in there, had fun, uh, posted a, a, a thing that was like, you boys better get ready. And they were like, oh shit, what's going on? And I said, uh, my name must be the boys because I'm back in town and I posted my picture of the man eater platinum. It's just fun having, yeah. you know, and that has been nothing short of delightful. Every time that we post in there, it's just us being ridiculous and having fun and goofy. And that's competitive gaming in a sense that's not even within a singular game. And that can be toxic. Liam had people who he hides his trophy information because he doesn't want people seeing his number of platinums because people start getting weirdly competitive about it. Yeah. And then being I can see that. Changing. And I mean it's I don't do that and thankfully I've never had that situation. I also don't have what I assume is hundreds upon hundreds of platinums. But the point stands. I can only imagine how I many he has. And it's crazy. He just said that he's gotten like 10 platinums like in the last two weeks is what it feels like he has more platinums than i had when i tried for like four months yeah and he, he probably gets those he's he's an oppressive man he is um but i guess that's it for the community's take because i'm gonna run over and get i don't want to completely avoid there's only two on facebook oh i didn't know i forgot facebook yeah. even exists so josh one. drago the important one that we were curious about he says turkey spaghetti is the best and boring lands is boring so yeah we knew that josh nothing <laughs> nothing we didn't know but hey There you go. Uh, Now, Mr. Ken Nace over there says, backwards compatibility is overrated. It's a nice feature, especially in the first year, but after after that, most people don't care about playing most older video games. And I got to say... This is a this is a hot take that I actually agree with. I, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be there, but I do think it's overrated in the fact that people talk about it like they're going to use it, but once they get it, they don't use it. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be there, but I do think it's overrated that over is the take. importance that people think. And I and I know that because I'm one of them. Actually, even what's weird, I so seldomly play old games that whenever I do. I don't. It, it, this is exclusive to me. I keep all my old consoles. If I want to play Near, I'm just going to boot up my PS3 and play Near. It would be more convenient we, on PS4. The, there's a point in news I think we'll get to that we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but that is a hot take. So thank you. It thank is a hot you, take. And I thank uh, the English nerd and Josh Ayers because they came through with their hot takes. And those are some really hot takes that we have. The hottest. For. We're going to get to ours. Why was Final end. Fantasy so popular? I don't know. But we're going to get to ours at the very end of the video. Fair. I want to do ours because um, I feel like mine's pretty spicy, especially for the podcast. 
Ooh. Uh, <laughs> okay. And we have a lot in the news. Okay, so starting off the news the way we've been doing, we're going to highlight our interesting game of the week. And this week's is Little Town Hero for the PS4. Uh, if you remember, this is a turn-based RPG from the makers of Pokemon uh, that came out on Switch back in October of last year. Now it's making its way to PS4. The game features a unique combat system where you use moves that counter the moves of enemies to defeat them, meaning that you have to use logic and creativity to overcome your foes as opposed to just grinding and brute force which is kind of interesting because this is actually quite a bit different from normal pokemon yeah normal pokemon is kind of like well if you want to you can just grind and whoop everybody but in this game you don't even have to grind at all you just fight and as long as you use your mind and you know you can okay okay there we go i figured out the exact combination i needed i heard this game is kind of like um, nino kuni and that it's it's kind of more like childish in nature but it's really fun if mm-hmm. you get into it so it, and you know it actually kind of has a similar art style and sense to, to like it's the, made by or it's not made by level five but it's inspired by level five art right it has to be it level looks five like it. slash um miyazaki i can't think of his first name wow oh yeah uh ghibli studio uh, yeah hideki miyazaki hideki yeah yeah uh but yeah that game looks really cool so the first thing up here though on the news is that kojima recently confirmed in an interview that despite mixed reviews death stranding sold the amount needed to be profitable and that he'd call it a success which is good to see when you have a game that's exclusive and that's with the pc version coming soon so uh he says they have enough money to internally prepare for their next po- project while also mentioning that recently a big project fell through last and citing that this happens often in the gaming industry, but we don't always hear about it. Uh, before closing off the interview, he responded to the rumors that Kojima picked up the rights to Metal Gear Solid and PT from Konami that were spiraling around and sounded ridiculous by saying, quote, oh, that's completely false. At least I didn't hear anything about it at all. And then ended with a laugh. Now, I don't mean this at all, but in the in the essence of trying to come back to Saul's ridiculous you know, PT is Silent Hills theory, or Death Stranding is PT is Silent Hills. No, it was never. That, that was a three step process. There, I said that. That's right. You, it was PT. Yeah, which it was. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was. But, but my point here is that he could completely. I don't believe this at all. But he could totally still be telling the truth with this oh, response. So now you're in the ruse cruise. I'm in you. the ruse cruise <laughs> with you. He could totally be telling the truth with this response. By because Konami himself did not, or sorry, Kojima himself did not get these from Konami. That is Sony Konami. would have. Sony would have. Well, he would have also, in these rumors. He would have heard about that because I know he still knows people who work at Konami. Well, yeah, but he, but the question was, did Kojima pick up the rights to PG to PT and? Well, that was what the rumor was about too. That's my point. Depending on what it is, he could still be in, not that he is, but he could still be involved in all these. But he himself did not maybe, get the rights. Maybe the uh, maybe the uh, Roos Cruise took you in the wrong direction, and that that's what fell through. <laughs> I actually thought about that when he said it. I was like, hmm. that, I knew that rumor was fake though. But then it got picked up that it was also now that Microsoft has bought that. And I'm just like, y- y'all, come on. Stop it with these stupid yeah. rumors. How does anybody believe in this stuff? All right. Next up, after a steady stream of delays to further refine the final product, Square Enix have finally put a date, uh, a new date rather, on Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered. The game releases on August 27th on PlayStation 4, Switch, and even smartphones. Interestingly, excluding Xbox, despite Xbox constantly trying to secure more Japanese games to their platform and even recently adding more uh, Japanese games to Game Pass and also just recently getting all the Final Fantasies. So why would this one not be coming to them? I find this interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's because they think the game is too niche like that. Oh, it's definitely a niche Final Fantasy game. It is. It's very good. Though. I, I, love I, this I know a lot of people who love Final Fantasy never even heard of that game when it got announced for remaster. Um, mm-hmm. Well, because it was a GameCube exclusive, and GameCube yeah, did not sell that much. Wind Waker, everybody knows a Wind Waker. That's a that's a this is Zelda first game. party. It's a Zelda, Zelda game though. That's true, but first it's also a main line. Game. It's a mainline Zelda, not a side Zelda. You, this is could, this is not Triforce could, Heroes, which could, I bet you there's plenty of people who've never heard of. If you know of Zelda, you know what Triforce you know if, you know what Triforce Heroes. If you're a Zelda fan, you know what Triforce Heroes are. Every every Final Fantasy new fan knew about Crystal Chronicles. Don't try to spin me that. Well, it's okay, a fun sure. game too. It is a very fun game. Uh, next up, despite sales of the series never being particularly astounding, the fa- uh, the Fantastic Dishonored series has not been put on hold, according to developer Arcane, or rather, it's not been put to rest for good. Uh, in an interview with IGN, the studio's co-creative director stated that while the studio isn't and never has been a single game studio, um, kind of like how you see, oh, this studio just makes this one game. Uh, he says that it's really it's been great for them to stretch their creative legs with both Prey 
three and the yet to be released death loop that they showed off last year. Uh, but that while dishonored is not necessarily finished, it is finished with the Caldwin storyline within that world as somebody who, and this is interesting about arcane up until dishonored two, they had never made a sequel to a game they'd made. And I think that dishonored two is one of the best sequels I have ever played. I still need to play it. It, it expands on everything that the first one did. Because you can pick the players perfectly. for even Corvo or Emily, right? Yes, you could be okay. both. And they have pretty drastically different play styles. So that that's one of those games that actually makes sense. You play through with one as that and the one is like Emily. And the story is different. How different? Like completely different? I haven't, as much as I love the game, I still have it and I plan to replay it as Emily, but it is quite a bit different. The way the game ends is... Because Corvo is such a cool character. I don't know. Corvo is like, awesome. That's definitely who I'd play through the first. Yeah. I'm not going to play through as his daughter the second, but like I will for sure play through it eventually. Yeah. No, it's a fantastic game. And I think so you played the first. Yeah. I think you would see what I mean by the jump is, is incredible. I think I actually own, let's see if PS Store uh, will work. I think that I actually own it digitally. Dishonored um, 2? No, 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 no. Dishonored, or Dishonored 1. Uh, Dishonored. Uh, game of the Year or whatever it was, the remastered version. What was it called? It wasn't Dishonored 1 Game of the Year. It was Dishonored. Definitive. Definitive, yeah. Yeah. Every game has to be definitive. Am I even logged in? I don't know. But it while is. you look at that, uh, I, I just say that if Dishonored 2 cumulatively sold. Uh, I don't. I thought I did. Uh, anyway, Dishonored 2 cumulatively sold like three and a half million. Uh, or two and a half million. That's what it was. Two and a half million. And Dishonored one on PC alone sold three million. So the series definitely. I don't know why, because the game got shown off a lot. It was at E three a lot. I think it just came out at a bad time. I don't know, because it's a fantastic game. But next thing uh, on the news is that Dead by Daylight announced that the iconic Pyramid Head will be making an, ex- an appearance in the game alongside a Silent Hill inspired map and Cheryl Mason returning or not returning but coming into the game as a survivor this feels like a smoking gun to me though this is you know we were just talking about the Silent Hill PT Thanks, rumors man. to me it would be weird for them to suddenly give Dead by Daylight the okay to use a Silent Hill name if they uh, and characters if they did not have intentions of ramping up and showing Silent Hill in some fa- short, some form. You never know though, because because the last I, thing I, we've seen the from credit. them is is a very crappy or at least a majority a uh, majority a majority agreed upon crappy um, Metal Gear Solid Five game. Oh yeah, you talking about um, survival? Survival, yeah. yeah. Or survive, rather. Uh, the thing here is that, to be fair to what's happening, it could just be Konami getting money on IP that otherwise is sitting there and just being used maybe for a pachinko machine. Uh, so it is possible. But to me, this is indicative with all the rumors circulating around and Konami actually saying that they had some hopes for something to happen with Silent Hill. This seems like this is them ramping up to do something with the franchise, whether it's them or whether it's Sony and, and them just doing it. We'll see whether it's Microsoft. I mean, we, who knows the craziest of things could happen and it could be announced that Microsoft did either license or buy the IP. I don't think so, but you never know. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, next up after middling performance and fan reaction to Sonic forces and the near yearly release schedule of Sonic games prior to that, excluding Sonic mania, Sega has expressed interest in shaking that up. Hence, while we've not heard anything on a new title in so long, the publisher is giving the teams more time moving forward to hopefully result in a better product. Uh, with Sonic's 30th anniversary coming next year for 2021, I personally expect that we'll see a game uh, release that year, and that will be four years between uh, the Sonic releases at all. Sonic Mania Plus came out in 2017 as well. I actually had a dream that Sonic Mania, Sonic Mania 2 was announced. I think that that's going to happen. Yeah, I uh, had a, I had a I had a very vivid dream, and what's crazy about that though is that mm. I had a dream that that happened. It was like I was like last weekend or the weekend before that, and then I went over to Big Seth's house and he was playing it. I was like, "Oh, that's cool." He's like, "Yeah, I'm trying to get the emeralds." Oh, uh, and yeah. I actually showed him where one of the emeralds was hidden that I remembered from my Sonic Mania playthrough. It was really weird how that happened, almost back to back. There was like three days in between that dream and then that happening. So I think we're getting a Sonic Mania two a announcement. Uh, 
Next up, if you remember last week, we talked about Tencent coming in and taking over the System Shock 3. Uh, well, they haven't slowed down, and what I talked about last week is coming more and more true every day. Uh, they have become majority stockholders in Marvelous Inc. and Xseed Games, the company behind the Rune Factory series, as well as more recently, the, the Switch title, Damon X Machina, uh, God of the 3, and the Sinran Kagura games. Um, I will reiterate that personally... I view this as nothing but a net negative. Yeah, there is nothing positive about a Chinese company coming in. I, 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 I want to back off that. There is nothing positive about a single company coming in and buying the majority of of any industry shares. It creates homogeneity. It's it's going to naturally. It's, it's the same way I feel about Disney and yeah. what they're doing and the I, the TV and movie sphere. Yeah, Disney with what they're doing, like uh, it, it's 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 a monopoly. It really is. And it's, it's a monopoly in a sense of... It's, it's not even that I'm worried about one person getting all the money. It's that... It's power. Creative control is going to start being somewhat catered to to the company that's providing the majority of the money to you. And that's the thing here. I don't... I have no care that China wants to censor the things they want to censor for themselves. That's fine. But when a company that's a Chinese company is behind a game uh, and one of the big and one of the biggest contributors monetarily to the company making a game, they're not going to include something in their game that they even release outside of China. Uh, it would still release in China, but they will not include something in the game, even in America, that they think would upset China. They got Dishonored 2 on Games Pass. Boy, I'm gonna play I bet that it. game I'm is beautiful on PC too. I'm going to download it. If not, uh, well, you got a one X. Yeah, I was gonna say, what do you play mean? there? Yeah, that's yeah. I, ju I just had a download the Long Dark on one X. Like, yeah, but in my mind, I was thinking ago? about you playing PC Games Pass. So no. the game probably would look beautiful on PC, but it looks great on console. I'm gonna wait till I get my 1440p monitor. Try that. Then I gotta upgrade my PC so I can play everything at 1440p so flawlessly. Over here, big balling the way I can uh, play 1080p flawlessly, except for Metro <laughs> Exodus. That game is ridiculous. I'm trying to run that on 1080p on PC. Oh, dude, yeah. It's like my graphics card and my CPU are overclocked. It's like I got I got six gigs of RAM on my my uh, on my video card alone, and it's like forty frames per second. I'm like, that's on old and on ultra settings. If I run down to high, it's not even sixty frames. I know that game has got some stuff on the PC version that's not active in the console versions, like hair well, you effects saw, and stuff like, like that. I was trying to show it to you, and like at one point the game ran fine, but then I tried to show it to you, and then it just did not work. Yeah, and then like I had to uninstall it, reinstall it, and wasn't that part of the Games Pass launcher though at the time? No, you're thinking of the Blizzard launcher with Destiny. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that. That was just a uh, either a bad download or that's just that game because that game still is is it's, it's either very it's so highly detailed that it's really hard to optimize or it's just unoptimized for crap. Huh. It ran fine on consoles. Yeah, well, I'm trying to run at 60 frames per second. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> Maybe that game is just not destined for 60 frames per second. No, I think it's not destined for my hardware. <laughs> Maybe not. Next thing up, though, PS Plus games for June have been announced with Call of Duty World War II being announced and available already for players and Star Wars Battlefront 2 joining it Tuesday, June 2nd. Uh, now, this is interesting because as... Uh, Sean Sanderud pointed out over in Discord, this is another month, two months in a row of the same genre for both games. Though I will say, this is an admittedly big month. These are two pretty high quality, well-known big games. Now, there are also games that are on sale fairly often, but this is a good month. It's always weird for me so that a yearly game franchise that typically dies down when the next year uh, year's iteration comes out yeah. is to give it out for free because it's going to revive the game for a little bit, but yeah. not really worth for me to go back to. And World War II is two, th almost three years old, right? It would be three years old this year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, that's fine. We didn't get Black Ops 3 until like two or three years later as well uh, when we got it on PS Plus. Yeah. Um, it's just weird. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen or whatever. Yeah, it's no. just It's just odd to me. It like, is, for sure. I mean, to be fair. Especially with how popular Warzone is. That game finds 150 people for you to play with. Uh, oh, immediately? Less than, yeah, less than 10 seconds on my, yeah. on my PS4. Yeah, and I wonder if it's because of the online community here or if this is more of a just like, hey, I don't. I guess I, I get why they won't, but I'm surprised I ha we haven't seen some bigger multiplayer games, like or bigger games that are story and multiplayer, yeah. to where we don't get a PS Plus version. This is something they actually did on PS3 that we don't get a PS Plus version of the game that's only the story and not the multiplayer. That way, if you want to play the story, you get a great story from PS Plus, and then if you want to buy the game to play the multiplayer, you can. 
Um, I'm not saying that's best for value, but what if that's what would be what happens for Call of Duty? Because why would it matter? Like, why not next year they give the Modern Warfare story, the new Modern Warfare reboot, just the story, and then keep the multiplayer separate? And just say, hey, if you want to play Warzone, that's they part of it. They already did that with Modern Warfare 2, didn't they? Didn't Modern Warfare 2 story come out, and that's the only thing that's out right now is just a story? No, when you got Modern Warfare 2 as part of PS Plus, I think you got the whole game. I'm pretty sure. If they have, then I don't that's think, good. No, I'm talking about Modern Warfare 2 Remastered. The one that came oh, out like six uh, months ago or whatever. I don't know about it, but There's I don't... There's no multiplayer for that, I don't think. No, I don't think there is either, but it's not part of PS Plus is what I'm saying. Right. Take a game that normally is a whole and on PS Plus say, hey, we're going to give you a game sooner than you normally would get it. Because you got to think, for Call of Duty, what reason do they have to, to not give you Modern Warfare a year later? Because people are still buying the game for playing multiplayer. Though, of course, I think Warzone is going to skew that a bit. But when you look at that... That's probably what's, I mean, to me, that'd be a good way to get games sooner, cut the multiplayer and then say, Hey, here's the story. Uh, PlayStation did that with their, um, Oh, what was it called? Not Starhawk. Uh, yeah, well, it was, it was Starhawk. There was Warhawk and then there was Starhawk. They gave you Starhawk campaign. And when you go to it on PS3, it says Starhawk campaign only. And I think that's a better way for them to get games to you quicker. that have bigger multiplayer things. That way you can play the story. And then if you decide that you like the way the game plays and you're like, I would like to try the multiplayer on this, you can go buy the multiplayer. Maybe even do something that Games Pass does where if you're playing the game on Games Pass and you have Games Pass, it'll say, hey, if you want to buy the game, you get it for 20% off or whatever discount off. Yeah. It'd be great if it's like, hey, we gave you Call of Duty. Like, you know, let's say what well, Black Ops 3 was last year's, right? We give This year, this month, we're giving you Call of Duty Black Ops, th- uh, Black Ops 4 or whatever, and we're going to give it to you the story mode, and if you want to buy the game to play the multiplayer mode, you can buy the game for 25% off. You yeah. get, you'd get sales on it for people who want to continue playing. They, yeah, they could. I mean, I could see that. I do feel like, though, that it's so weird with each and every uh, Call of Duty, though, because it's the, the way that they're made by different developers every year. You get fanboys of each and other developer. That's true. So, man, yeah, who so knows? It could be, could be interesting. All right, let's see. Good month, though, really. I mean, oh, I I'll, say, I'll give them that. I did say that after all that crap with Battlefront 2 happened, I said I'll never buy that money and I'll, 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 no. I'll, I'll show them my words and I'll... Not ever give them a cent out of my wallet, and I don't have to because I just do it for free. <laughs> yeah, see, I was, I have, I'm probably not going to. I, have no I was going. In that. I, I don't really know. I, I wanted to play the story, which is pretty short, just to see what it was like. I feel like it's not going to be that great of a story. I feel like the story itself Who would knows? be good, but the actual story gameplay would not be great. Yeah, we'll see. I probably, mean, it would probably just be like but Battlefront. Did Battlefront have story in like Battlefront Two? On the PS2, and didn't that Battlefront oh, yeah, that Rogue bad, Squadron though. have a story too that was pretty yeah, bad? Yeah, they were they were just campaigns for you to play. Without yeah, that's being all this is, isn't it? <laughs> no, this has actually got a story. And well, I mean that, but I'm saying like, isn't it just like Battlefront missions? Like, aren't you just pretty much playing Battlefront games yeah, or sure. something? Yeah, I don't know about how Battlefront Two plays. If it plays well, then giving me a story to wrap that up in that I don't have to be online for, I'm down. I'm sure it plays well. It's made by Dice, isn't it? Dice and EA. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I play. Plays well too in terms of just generally speaking, but I don't care for the way Battlefield games play personally. I mean, they play well though. They play well. I just, I mean, they're just not my type of game. I know, but I'm saying like, that, like yeah. the nature of those games. Yeah. I never. It's, I, I, I was speaking more specifically to me. Oh, like, okay. If, if I if I like the way Star Wars Battlefront Two plays, then yeah, giving me a story that I can just play without having to worry about being online if I don't want to be online is a great way for me to get to experience the mechanics and the gameplay. Without having to worry about I mean, online people, yeah, because I I just don't care for online play all that much. It's not that I'm I mean I'm I'm okay at it. It's just not normally something that gets to me. But either way, uh, for ter- for potential buyers waiting for reviews, much like Saul, before buying the game after any uncertainty that the leaks may have caused are in for a surprise. This is in regards to The Last of Us Two, which I apparently didn't type in. Yeah, uh, I, I, I realized that's what it was when I was yeah. reading the doc. The reviews for The Last of Us Two go live Friday, June twelfth, which is one full week before the release of the game. In an industry that has so often pushed reviews back to either hit the same day of release or sometimes in Bethesda's after. case, where they don't give people review copies and you just have to buy the game you get them after uh to me this is either just something that they don't realize is showing this way but to me this shows that they have a lot of confidence in this game they realize that come on i mean there's no way they don't but right on the 99.99 or really the 0.1 percent chance that you know but yeah if two boys and two boys in arkansas realize that they realize right so marketing team so here's the big thing 
Is this because they're confident in it themselves, or is this because they think that by putting the review out a week early that it makes it look like they're confident, and I, that that confidence will trans- transport over to I the have, buyers? I have two, what, I, what I'm pretty sure is what the reasonings are. I'm not going to say them here, but I have two. Well, I'll say one now, and that's just because I think that Sony wants to show that they are confident that the game will sell well, so they're going to put out reviews uh, well, early. But they'd be confident that the game would review well. If they're going to put out reviews that way, that's not even, I mean, it's tied to sales. Well, I should say they are confident in people um, following Naughty Dog, like people follow Zelda, where like there are people who, despite the like the actual game or the, the death, will still give it 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, yeah. just like Zelda. Um, but what's interesting is, did you watch the state of play? I haven't gotten to it yet. No. Okay, I watched it because I, I I have nothing to lose. I, well, I want to watch it. I just yeah. I've been uh, addicted to Man Eater and then addicted yeah. to Minecraft. And for me, it, it kind of it reassured me that like I knew that the gameplay in this game would still be good despite what I think the the story beats could be sure pretty iffy on. But what I'll say though is, and I'll say this very vaguely, um, and I'll say this more so in the future for certain that they did something in this. Uh, they did something. In this state of play, that 100% without a doubt confirmed that the leaks are indeed true, I mean, or at least at least the leaks I'm talking about. There are leaks out there of like people trying to predict the ending and the exact end or whatever. I'm not yeah. talking about any of that. I'm the, not, the leaks that we've mentioned on the show every time have been proven to be real. Yes, I mean, I'm not talking about the, the the leaks that actually may not may or may not be real. I don't know if I ever even saw those, but um, I will say though that I can't tell if it's clever that the way they did that or if it's just they didn't realize they did it. That's and that's one of those that I'm actually not sure if they realize that they did it or not, and I obviously cannot discuss it further anymore with you because you don't yeah. know the leaks. Yeah. Um. But I, you know, I, what I saw was like pretty much what you would expect from a next gen Last of Us game. It looks like the Last of Us one running way better, running more fluid, and running, um, I would say more realistic. I guess even though I, I think that there's we we've talked about it before there's a weird boundary that Neil Druckmann does like with realism that I don't like. Like having to name all the characters and having them call out names, I don't care that much for like that kind of immersion in a game like this. I like the idea and I like the world building, but I remember the reason in that you specifically mentioned as to why you don't like it is the reason he said he put it. in the Yeah, game. it's it's, it's it, it, it it makes you want to feel like a monster if you kill like these people because or it, it it should add hesitation to you killing them because you should feel more uh, more of for them on a more humane level. I'm like, no, dude, they're bad guys. I'm going to shoot them. Like, I don't <laughs> care about that. Like, I think it's in my attention, or my, in my, um, opinion, that's more pretentious than anything. Yeah. Well, it's you kinda know, like Christopher Nolan doing like, Oh, well, uh, here's all my actors. What do y'all think? We didn't understand the script. Uh, the, this, we didn't understand the script at all. Aha. Silly Christopher Nolan. No, that's pretentious. Like get out of here. Like, yeah, he's a good director, but if you're having actors say like, they don't understand the script, that's not a, that's not a good side of anything except the fact that you're Christopher Nolan. So, uh, what's interesting about that remark about the whole, you know, we're doing this I, again. I like it from a world building standpoint to it's, me. It's it does. It like, helps with immersion. Well, I this was an RPG or something. And I needed that kind of immersion fight. I don't like, well, I mean, but the game is definitely, it is all subjective. Of course. Yeah. The game is from, from, uh, and I don't know, I haven't played it, but from what they're saying, there definitely is an intense uh, or an intention on their part to make the game blow up and feel bigger and feel more, not an RPG, but feel more like an, open world game where this would be a little more like, okay, yeah, I get that. Now I'm not saying the game's open world, there, but there's, there's a fundamental problem I have with this game now, though. So, but I'll tell you after you watch the video, that's fine. But because it's parallels exactly to another game. And I'm okay. just like, come, come on guys. Like I, <laughs> it actually makes me worried now, not from a story standpoint, but from a, another standpoint, when you watch it or I'll actually just tell you off video in case okay. there are people yeah. Who, who it, it has to do with something. If you're going to watch it, it's not a Yeah, I am level. going to watch it. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you after the video. Okay. I know there are people who probably haven't watched it that want me to remain. So, in ambiguous. relation to your thing, though, about making you feel like a monster about your actions, I think that there have games that are, there are games that are over 10 years old, or that are 10 years old this year, rather, I'll say. There's one game in particular that's already addressed that. And I mean, yeah, such it, a great it, way it has that done. I don't think that I have to play The Last of Us for sure, but I almost know it's not going to be as good as this because they're trying to do it front loaded. So in near, I've, I've mentioned yeah. this in near when you now, start the second playthrough, it's nothing out. crazy, yeah. But when you start the second playthrough, uh, there is a there is a new 
um, point of view that you're given and some new scenes that you're given that change the context in which the actions that you committed in your first playthrough are like, oh crap, I'm a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. Kinda. I mean, not exactly. It's not that like you're the bad guy, you but it makes you it makes you regret. That the that the and it's it's brilliant game making. The first way that you play through is like, no, these are just monsters. Screw them. Let's kill them. And then the second one's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have been so uh, quick to jump to that judgment. But well, the game framed it that way. One on thing, one thing I don't like in any in any form of media, it's when somebody is talking about their own product and they are like, oh yeah, and you could see we've developed this technology to be able to do this here. And it's kind of like it kind of harkens back to like Call of Duty Ghost, where they're like. Or was it maybe it was Black Ops 3 where they're like, you could swim through the water and watch the fishes move. No, that was Ghost. And it was like, (laughs) really? Because Mario 64 does that too. Like, come on. This is not new technology in kind. Like, what you're doing is you're taking a kind of a cool feature and you're just blowing it up to a really pretentious level. Yeah, because I'd say, like, you know, you look at The Last of Us 2 and one of the things they were talking about, I watched like a little Twitter video that was, or it was like a maybe five minute video or whatever about uh, the technology behind it. So I've probably seen some of the stuff that's yeah, I mean, in yeah, the I'm state sure of play. Like it's, it's, um, I will say that if you're, if you're not watching the state of play, this is coming from somebody who's, who has the, uh, has plot points spoiled, but like if you're not watching a state of play, you're not missing a whole lot of anything. Um, you're missing essentially what was already shown at E3. Like you're just missing gameplay beats at yeah. this point, and it's different. It's it is different gameplay beats. Yeah, which, I, which I, it's really what I'm interested they, in. They'll show you the a couple like. of cool things, some things that I'm kind of like, I I kind of really just like, why is that in the game? Um, because it's it's a very cliche thing in the third person game. And mm. I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, about yeah, that. we'll talk about it more later. later. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, th- what they were talking about in that video that is like you know it, it borders on pretension at least depending on who you are but i also think it's part of just tech when you're in a tech driven thing it doesn't hurt to say these things and honestly, it doesn't hurt to say them, you're gonna but hear, to you're gonna hear people say them. And yeah, make yeah, a yeah, it depends. point out of them because like one of the things that neil Druckmann i think mentioned is that they built technologies to like um be able to change like in real time the amount of sweat on a character how much blood is in their eyes and stuff to further be able to express emotion without having to say something and that you know we had a topic on this show months m- months ago maybe even a year ago at this point about like immersion and do graphics and- do graphics actually help tell a better yeah. story and you know we said it's, it's not that it 100% helps to tell a better story but it helps to immerse you in that story but it does yeah it does give you more tools to tell that story I think is the best way to say it because 10 years ago if you wanted to be able to have, there's a scene in The Last of Us 2 stuff that w- that has been shown where like she's walking in, she's pointing a gun at somebody, and there's just so much emotion on her face. She doesn't yeah. have to say anything, but you can see what it is. And it's like, uh, you know, 15 years ago, any emotion would have had to have been expressly said. Well, it's not only that. It's you know, shown so, in the E3 2016 footage. There yeah, was... The little, like the shaking in her hands. Well, the shaking in her hands. It was when, the, it was when uh, one of those, um, I, I at this point know what they are. I'm not going to say it. But it was the people that were hunting her. Mm-hmm. They looked down under the car and she shot them in the head. It, it The head didn't, you, uh, like... Funnily blow back or blow off just, or thing. It was just one of those things that like where they just sunk to the ground, and that's what happens when you get shot in the head. Like yeah. you're not just you're not blown across the room. It's not, not that it makes the story better. It yeah, just it makes immer- the, immerses you better to the story. Yeah. So either way, it just kind of goes back to that. But it, they didn't see. It, but there my, is a fine line between pretension well, and just talking about. What I just good said tech. wasn't ever blown up into like, oh yeah, you guys see how that's the first one shot in the head. Well, they noticed how they just collapsed and died. Yeah. This is how it immerses. And, like, it, well, and it, it, it's it's better to be left alone and let people discover stuff like that than that, it is. Yeah. There's that, but then there's also what context you're saying it in are you saying it at a dice talk where you're talking to somebody about how the future of animation and what you're choosing to do it's like as you can see in this example we chose to move animation forward and be more realistic by getting rid of the ragdoll physics where this would just blow you back because there was a blow to you instead yeah. it's going to go through and be more realistic the animation is actually trying to display what someone would look like had they been shot through the head if you're doing a tech talk about that, which most people are not going to watch, that's fine. Yeah, Even if, though if with where just, we are right now, if you're people just on are blowing Twitter up about, shouting out about it. It's like, no. Yeah, it depends. I mean, again, it, it's just that it's fine that you do it. It's just you risk looking pretentious. Even if Miyazaki came online and was like, in Elden Ring, if you unsheath your sword, there's going to be a different sound for each sheath you use. And it all sounds like this. I'm like, that's cool, but it depends on who you are. Because like, there's a button. There's a there's people that were like, oh my god, there's a button in Ghost of Tsushima that lets you sling your blood off, which is cool, actually. I mean, if I'm being honest, that is cool. I doubt that's an actual button map to that. That's, I'm pretty, that's I, what it could, says. You could do it. But that's like, what I, it said. Because like, I saw them do it. I was like, oh, that actually landed on the ground under the sword. That was yeah, pretty cool. That was I doubt cool. there's an actual button that is sole function. That, for that's that. what it says. There's no that that button is tied to another function and it just does. Well, okay, that. when I say that, it's, it's probably to sheath your sword. You probably press square and then if the you first just, time it'll do that. 
you just tap it real quick and just throws that off. Maybe instead of sheathing it. If you yeah. sheath, you have to hold it. But that's, that still means it's a, I mean that still means that there's a button dedicated to that function. But not only a button. But it's not, not our whole yeah. argument is that there's not just one button dedicated to blood off your sword. Speaking of which, can we come back to? I meant to say it during Minecraft, but this is something for your own good. Be careful with button contact sensitivity. In trying to make this game simple for everybody. Minecraft decided oh, no. that every action needs to be X. Eating food, picking up yes. stuff. It, it's ridiculous, and it will sometimes get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, just like I, just like throwing dynamite instead of shooting your arrows. Yes, it's it was bad. There's more buttons. Do some other stuff. Uh, anyway, moving on. Let's, let's blow through the rest of this news, because we still got our hot take. <laughs> yup. Okay, so in an interesting move from Sony, I noticed this just, uh, whenever I was pulling together news, seemingly following what I think is their want to remove barriers uh, between their locations and create a global company as they've been talking about for the last few years. Uh, whenever you go to the PS blog sites now, used to it would funnel uh, US users to the region specific US version. EU users would go to the EU one and so on and so forth. Now, if you look, it's all just blog.playstation.com. Yeah, no blog EU or anything. So that means all announcements are going to be global now. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting because sales are not all global. So, this is a weird move. I actually felt like having regions made sense because like right now, uh, whenever you look at like the Turkish uh, PlayStation Store, I went on to get the free version of Mafia 2. Yeah. And it had a way different sale going. It was a Ramadan sale that we don't have going on. We sure don't have that sale so going on. It was, it's interesting. But either way, that may, that may be indicative of some kind of change they're wanting to do with the way they handle announcements. Who knows? Uh, next up. As of July 13th, Sony is requiring all developers to ensure that their submitted titles for certification on PS4 are also compatible with the PS5. Compatibility, as deemed by Sony, entails the submission code, uh, the submitted code to run without issue on PS5 and provides the same features on PS5 as it does on PS4, meaning that game modes or graphical features must be consistent between the two systems. This is weird because this doesn't sound like games that are made for PS4 that also need to be able to be printed on a PS5 disc. This sounds like for backwards compatibility. Purposes. Yeah, it just needs to run on PS5. And it needs to run exactly the same. Yeah. So this does kind of breed a little bit of worry into the potential that backwards compatibility is not going to be as seamless as a lot of people hope for, which was already a worry that was spurred on by the Mark Cerny Tech Talk. Right. Um, so... This is kind of interesting because following up on that, there's a topic of backwards compatibility in relation to PS5 in general, where there are rumors circulating via what is said to be a Turkish, <laughs> coming back to them, retailer's PS5 page. Uh, the page details backward compatibility for more than just PS4 titles, saying that all PS2, PS3, and PS4 games with the odd lack of PS1 being mentioned, uh, compatible with the system via the Blu-ray drive, which if so, that's fantastic. But... Um, Take this with a grain of salt, of course, because this is a, a translation, and sometimes translation gets lost in some stuff. Yeah, uh, we talked about that a few episodes back. Yeah, so, but with that in mind, isn't it kind of crazy? It's hard to want to believe any of this, and again, it's rumor, so you shouldn't just believe it. But when you kind of think about it in relation to what we just read, if not even all PS4 games work... And are having to make sure they're made in which to be How that can way. All PS3 and why PS2 would all PS two, PS three, and PS four? And then if all of those are working, why not PS one? You yeah. t you know there you know how many good PS one emulators there are out there, including the ones that Sony used on Vita and PS three. Yeah, and those are and what's funny is though those are better emulators than, than the used one they for put PS one classic exactly. Um, but yeah, like at this point in time, like. With with a rev uh, a reveal only five days ahead for us currently four days ahead if you're watching on the day it comes out um, I'm not I'm not giving a single grain of salt to any nope. of these rumors yeah I'm just why like, why why overly speculate when we may have answers because I, I, I doubt any of these rumors are real I I realistically think we're only gonna get PS4 games on I think and so it's gonna, as well it's gonna be like what we know now it's gonna be select PS4 games it's not gonna be every one of them but it's gonna be all the major ones maybe it'll be every PS4 title. After like a year after launch, maybe it's just that they want to make sure, like, like like they talked about, people were like freaking out that it was only going to be a hundred games. But what they're doing is they're starting testing with the top one hundred games. That way, for sure, by launch, you know that the most, the one hundred most popular games work flawlessly. Yeah. And then they said before launch, they have plans to test thousands of games. Yeah. So it's hard to say. And honestly, this may be worrying about nothing. All PS4 games may work without flaw, and they're just checking. 
But right now, it's just in comparison to Xbox coming out this week and saying that our goal is at launch to have all three thousand something yes. games backwards compatible yes. is ridiculous. Yeah. So Pe- people say like that 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 they won't use backwards compatibility, but there's always that one day where you're like, I don't have anything to play, but dang, Fable Two sounds fun. Yeah, I'm I, go- having just replayed Fable One. Yeah. Clearly, <laughs> it's 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 always an option that's fun to go back to. Of course, it's never going to be the main well, frame of a system, but an option. And I should say that there is one very big benefit of looking into backwards compatibility versus enhanced backwards compatibility. So, if I'm being honest, I don't know that I would have replayed Fable One, or I would have been as keen to replay. I should at least say that had it not been for the fact that when you play it on the Xbox One X, it runs it. A native 4K resolution. So there's and it runs at a better frame rate. Yeah, because there's, there's another incentive to, for to go yes. for you to play this game to see what it looks like. Exactly. So I think when you look at it that way, backwards compatibility that has enhancements, which PlayStation does say that play that PS4 games that were built with an unlocked mode, which there are plenty of, that they'll be able to tap into the extra CPU power and run at a higher resolution if they had variable resolution, uh, and run at a higher frame rate if they had uncapped frame rate. Yeah. So you'll still have that. Uh, But, like, one of Microsoft's things that they talked about was that even old games that had no HDR is going to, and I don't know how this is going to work. It's going to have HDR. It's going to have HDR. That sounds kind of like some BS, like like Red Dead Redemption's HDR that wasn't real HDR. But we'll see. It, it does, but with like this, all these new consoles coming out, this brand new tech, it's kind of hard to do, distinguish what's BS and what's not. Even then, if it changes the way the game's colors are handled, it's still a change, and it's a reason to go back and play something because it's going to be different. Like I swear, if we get the PS5 and its SSD in it is just a regular SSD, I'm going to flip everything over in the world. <laughs> oh. Because for, for the, a normal console person does not know how fast an SSD really is. So if they're using some marketing just for this to be a normal <laughs> SSD in this thing, I'm going to end the world. Like, uh, I will I will cause the apocalypse myself. Yeah. Well, we'll see how that ends up working out for you. Uh, but for the y'all. last two, or the last thing, rather, that we have to talk about is, of course, Sony have finally confirmed an event for PS5 games after months of rumors. The event will take place Thursday, June 4th, and last for roughly an hour, showcasing what looks to be primarily, if not only, games from both first- and third-party studios for Sony's next-gen console, which I do think that while talking about games and showing games, there's a good chance that they will clarify backwards compatibility here. And maybe a console sneak peek of some kind. Now, here's the thing. I think it's unlikely that we see price console and date, but there is at least a reasonable chance that it's, we'll get one of those three. It's June. In four months, we should have this console in our hands. Or five. Five months. Yeah, five. Uh, somewhere in that I ballpark. need to know, like, first of all, the average person buying this, it's probably going to have to save some money. So these people kind of need to know ahead of time if this thing what costs the, $600. What the price is. Yeah. yeah. But even then, it's like, come on, man. Five months ahead, I knew what the Switch looked like. Yeah. I mean, everybody does things differently. And if you remember, or you may not have seen it, actually. You know, so not remember. If it, you what do you mean seen, differently, though? Technically, Sony revealed the PlayStation 4. Oh, yeah. But they're, they're, seven? they're doing differently. Or well, Microsoft's even doing differently from what they did. I mean, They're still eight and, months ahead of the game, yeah, too. No, I know. But I'm just saying every company is not doing their exact thing from last generation as much as it's easy to want to fall back on that. I mean, it's fine. I, I, I do agree that all those things need to be shown. We'll see when that happens. There ain't happens. nothing you can do about it, though, I guess. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. And they keep saying that there's more to talk about after this. So what if this PS5 event blowout is just the start of them doing a monthly big blowout? So, like, maybe we see the games this year. I mean, this month. Don't get my hopes up. Next month, we get the console, the price. And then the next one, we get uh, the release date. UI deep dive. Whatever it be. You know, they have plenty of things they can do. Yeah. Um, but... The other thing to note there, which is just kind of cool, is Blue Point, uh, who we've been wondering what the heck they're working on. Uh, they seem to be in attendance, but technically it could not be. But the studio's technical technical director responded to the announcement on Twitter, saying, "Quote: I'm so excited for the future. It is time to push forward and leave our old gaming limitations behind us." End quote. Now, this could just be him celebrating the PS5 as a whole and saying. Gaming as a whole, and play at least as we're regarded as going to be moving forward. I know what this means, but this to me sounds so much like, hey, you know how we've been confirmed to be making a PS5 game since we've shipped the, you know, uh, Shadow of the Colossus remaster or remake, whatever you want to call it. Get ready, boys. I don't think they've been confirmed to be making a PS5 game. They're confirmed no, to be they working have, on something. No, right? Mark, Mark Cerny has specifically okay. said that they are working on a PS5 game, and so have they. Okay, so but nobody said that they're not working on multiple things. Here's what they're been. doing, though. They're the ones making the emulation system for the PS3 and the PS5. 
And that's why they say we need to leave our PS limitations two, behind. No, PS3. You said PS5, though. The you PS3 said, emulation in the PS5. Oh, in the PS5. Yes. I thought you said and the PS5. No, and this is what they mean by the old limitations of having to lug your consoles around every time you want to play an old game. Oh, is this coming back to the backwards compatibility stuff? They're, they're making the backwards compatibility stuff. My PS3 will continue to be on my desk because it's beautiful and I love it. I will continue. You know what? We'll get into this. If not next on my week's, desk, it'll go somewhere. Next back week's here. episode, when we answer a uh, community set question, we're going to ask you in a minute after we answer our own. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the old thing of like everybody ever once said, you don't need an, uh, or, or they always said, like, you don't need a smartphone. You can just carry on an MP3 player and a phone. <laughs> and those same people have smartphones now that do it all anyways. It's like, come on. I have one thing that do it all does it all. That's the future. Not having five consoles I mean, on my that, desk. I think it's irrefutable that that is definitely the future. If, it, if it's possible, being able to do more things in one device always feels more futuristic. See, as is, long as it can do them all as well as the individuals. And I would argue that the biggest problem with smartphones is that their DAC for audio is awful. Even for it headphones. On which one you and get. then most people are using Bluetooth. So really, you would have a much better listening experience if, if you, you buy cared. a $300 Sony if you, Walkman. No, even if, 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 dude, a Zune HD has a better DAC than your modern smartphone. Where am I going to buy a Zune HD in 2020? My point is, is, if you still have a Zune HD, you technically would get a better listening experience by listening to music on it than from your phone. Oh, you can buy one on Amazon. Yeah, no, they're awesome. I, I, I have seriously debated. I would buy one again if they were Bluetooth compatible, but they're, they're not. used. Yeah. I want to find a new one. Oh, you probably can. I mean, I don't know exactly where, but use like no 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 okay no that is one of the absolute best so, mp3 players ever to have existed so we're gonna so here's how i want to end this episode we're gonna end this episode like we normally do with what our community's take is going to be and then i want us to, to tell us tell everybody our hot gaming takes but i don't want to expound on them okay. and on them at all because okay. i think it'll be much better to, to get our hot community takes out and then be like and then have people discuss about it in discord and on twitter and stuff <sighs> Rather Ooh. than debate them ourselves, because you, we could debate them in real life. We have done it before, actually, with one or two of these, I'm sure. Plenty of times. But uh, next week's community take. We guys want you to answer this, and then we'll feature it on next week's episode. Sony has recently reiterated that their belief in generations, and this is going to be a hot take for some people, a hot take for none. But they mm -hmm. be, uh, they say we believe that when you go in uh, on the trouble of creating a next gen console, that you should include features of benefits the previous generation does not include. And in that, our view, people should make games that can make the most of future features. We are thinking it is time the PlayStation community, or it is thinking it is time to give the PlayStation community something new, something different that can really be enjoyed on PS5. Now, a lot of people, they're not sure about what this means exactly in correlation to generations. Uh, Obviously, they're pro backwards compatibility, so that it's not exactly about leaving every generation behind. But I think it's more about making. I think this is in direct, and this is the way we can kind of say it. This seems to be in direct response to Microsoft's choice to say that generations are a little bit more fluid, and that if we make a game for the Series X, it's also going to work on seven-year-old Xbox One hardware. Uh, yeah. And whereas Sony's saying we made a game for the PS5, and we have no interest for making that exact same game for the PS4 scaled back. Yeah, and I agree with that too. Um, do you? Do you agree that the, uh, the consoles should be kept in generations where it is slated and there is a date in which one generation will begin and one will end, even though that the other generation can keep on going, it is still the end of that generation marking the new generation, like we will see this winter for the PS5. Uh, do you like that or do you like the more Xbox side of things where everything kind of blends together and the new consoles are more so of new additions um, that you'll be getting and obtaining instead of keeping your old ones? Um, there you go. Gaming hot take, Brett. You want mine? Yeah, you we'll do yours first, then we'll do mine. Nintendo should go the route of Sega and just put their games on every console and stop making really bad machines for too much money. I like their machines, so they're I agree, built, though. I they're, agree. <laughs> they're I, built. They're built poorly, and I think the that Switch they, Lite's not built poorly. Okay, the Switch Lite is not built. Okay. Poorly. <laughs> um. So you want to hear mine? Yep. This is going to make a lot of people mad. This is the true hot gaming take you, you people asked for. Or that actually that I asked you to ask us for. Um, in anything that I've ever played, this is all personal experience, very personal opinion. There is not a trilogy that has the lore and the story and the backstory on PlayStation that is an exclusive that can match that of Halo 1, 2, and 3. 
That is the hottest take I may have ever heard. I've never played Infamous. That is the only game series of my You've also mind. never played Resistance well, 1, that, that 2, too, and 3. Yeah. Yeah, so that, you've that, also never played Killzone 2 and 3. Well, I played you played Killzone them, 1. but you didn't beat them, and you played Killzone 1. Yeah. Uh, so this, now, I, now, to be that, fair, that's why I had to specify that, uh, that I had to, that, out of anything I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of sci-fi, I think Halo has all those series beat with having all the extra books. Oh, okay, sci-fi you, you, it, at least is better because I was about to say, dude, there's so much I think I, lore. Did I specify sci-fi trilogy? No, you just oh. said, you said exclusive. Well, I would consider infamous sci-fi. Yeah, you know, fair, but I'm talking like, dude, God of War. We're we're not supposed to we're not supposed to argue. Well, well, we're well, not supposed that's, to argue. That's where sci-fi comes into play, you dummy. Well, now that you said that, but you yeah, uh, I thought initially. I said that at first. Yeah, my bad. Sci-fi. I was I was having to place my words correctly so but, I wouldn't die. But we're not supposed to argue with them anyway. But now at least you further told you so that everyone else can yell at us for whatever we say yeah so hey guys if you like the episode on youtube like it if you dislike it that button's there too uh don't you mean if you dislike don't you mean if you like to hit the dislike button nope if uh (laughs) if you watch us on a podcast service that has a rating system please give consider giving us a rating uh don't just give us five stars because we tell you to give us a rating you think is what you believe that we are worth and uh read uh write a review if you can if you uh, have any spare moments of time just like we were talking about earlier uh with yelp and um if you have any friends that like p- gaming uh ps4 xbox or anything like that but focus on ps4 let us know let them know of us because we'll love them to be in our little family of communities i'd like to thank everybody who has watched and who has enjoyed our content over the last three years and we have patreons to prove that yeah we love if, you all. if you think we're worth more than five gold stars yeah we can give us five can... one dollar bills a month <laughs> <laughs> all right well at the end of every episode we like to thank our patrons for helping to support the show so that we can continue doing this without having to dig into our own pockets and we are forever grateful of yes, that. i'll tell you that for sure so with that said we'll see you guys next week thank you thank you all Thanks to our patrons, Josh Jarrell, Matthew Green, my name is Dan, Luke Bartolomeo, Sean Santarude, Funk Turkey, Danny Villiobos, Corey Hickerson, Blake Popst, Kevin Bacon Bits, Shadowist, Steven Salazar, The Stonard, Travis Below, Eduardo Palomino, Stefan Swanland, Constantly Kenny, Solitary Red, Chris Figs, Brian, Donovan Williams, William Digital Spooker, Derek Porter, Josh Ayers, Brandon Edwards, Sean One Neo, Tyler Powers, and Mr. El Tabib. If you would like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash nartech and consider giving as little as a dollar per month. Thank you.